Alex um, Eason and Andy Allen. And on Starleaf at the moment, we have Kelly Armstrong, Shinia Dennis, and Mark Durkin. Um, so I'll go straight to agenda item one, which is apologies. We've received an apology from Carol. Um, Sinead, have you an apology from Fra? Yeah, apologies from Fra. I'm Carol. Thank Carol. you. Thank you. Okay, we're a bit echoey on our star life at the minute, but hopefully that will resolve itself as we we'll go on. I'll move to agenda item two, which is chairperson's business. Member, um, a CLG was convened um, on Tuesday to discuss potential increased COVID restrictions, following on from agreement that only essential business will be conducted in plenary. Um, members, there was no definite de decision was taken at the chairperson's liaison, liaison group on Tuesday because not all parties were present. So that has been sent out to parties to come back um, to make a final decision. But I, I kind of just will highlight to you that they are suggesting that uh, where possible we should go to fully virtual meetings for all of our committee meetings as well. Um, uh, just to, it just would make things a lot easier and reduce the, the risk, um, especially to, to those guys that look after our, our um, you know, TV and, and sound with all of our committees. Um, so that, that I know that poses a problem for some members. It poses a problem. I'll bring you in a minute, Andy. And I know it also poses a problem for the likes of Sinead, who has absolutely dreadful um, Wi-Fi, where she is as well. Um, now, in saying that, when we raised that issue, um, we were kind of told that well, there is the, the issue of doing dial-in, or there's the option of doing dial-in, but there's also the option of using, if you have 4G, if you're lucky enough to, enough to have 4G wherever you are, of using your hotspot um, to come in as well. So it's just to let members know there's been no definite decision made on it as yet, um, but they really do are encouraging all members, where possible, to dial-in from home or from their office, or from their office even here in Parliament buildings, rather than come into the committee room, just to kind of keep the, 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 um, the possibility of infection to absolute minimal. Andy, you want to come in? Yeah, no, absolutely, Chair, and I can understand the, the position in respect to that. It's just obviously from my own perspective, it would pose difficulties for me in respect of being able to read the committee pack with, with my eyesight. Um, so I would be keen to have dialogue and engagement ar around that. Um, in that respect, obviously, I don't want to be putting anybody at risk in, in respect of me coming in here, but um, just maybe look at ways, if, if possible, I can be facilitated or look at uh, measures that can be put in place to help me be able to ensure that I can continue to operate in the committee as, a, as effective uh, as I need to be. No, and I did, and I'd spoken to you anyway, Andy, about this. I did raise the issue of yourself at our CLG, um, and it may come down to that it just will be Andy, the clerk, and myself in this room, and just the three of us and no one else. That what it, that is what it could come down to. Um, but I will hi, I'll update members as we know. Uh, sorry, Sinead, do you want to come in? Yeah, sure. It's just uh, I chaired standards and privileges yesterday, and it was fully virtual. And it was an absolutely unmitigated disaster. Um, now, and that wasn't, it wasn't actually, because we, I've, we've actually got new broadband uh, where I am. So it's, it, the problem wasn't on my end. It was actually on uh, Starley's uh, end. And I know Stuart Dixon was at um, our meeting yesterday as well. And he'd been at a, at a committee meeting yesterday morning and said that they experienced the same issues with Starley. So um, I know it was brought up at the commission yesterday in terms of the, the capabilities of, of uh, star life so it's just to be mindful of that as well um because you know if, if people are up for it they're up for going vir fully virtual obviously in the times that we're in but um if the if there's gremlins in the equipment then it's going to make it very difficult yeah thank you for letting us know that Sinead, because i know that chris little had said at clg that he was going to try doing the education committee um fully virtual and see how go and feed that back but i think what you're saying there is um, actually good feedback for the clerk to hear to pass back to the other clerks as well to have that discussion just how it went um i don't know how confident i would be chairing uh, a meeting virtually i'm sure that was difficult enough as it is to try and do that mm -hmm. without having the clerk beside you um and without having the various screens around you to see um who wants to speak and in what order so um thank you uh, Sinead for letting us know that as well. So it's just putting that out to members. 
um, that that's the direction that the Assembly want us to take. Um, so uh, there will, uh, no doubt, uh, over the next week or two, we'll hear more information on that. And the other issue. Hi, yeah, sorry, go sorry. ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Excuse me. I've somewhat, someone mentioned Gremlins there that I seem to have a new one today. Okay. <laughs> Where I can see you, hear you, and you can hear me, but for some some reason the camera's not working. So he's are getting off light this morning. I suppose you don't have to look at me. Very disappointed, Mark, that we don't have your lovely face up in front of us, so I am. But yeah, you're absolutely right. We can't hear you, but we can't see you. But I, uh, your hand your hand function button is working, just to let you know that. I was just testing that there, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, the other issue I wanted to bring up with members is also the, the, the move um, when it comes to essential business and oral briefings. We've also been asked to limit our briefings as well to the bare essentials. Now, that's for up for debate as to what is the essential. I mean, anything relating to COVID, I would imagine, would be essential, whether that's funding, whether that's anything else. And most certainly our bill um, that is in front of us at the moment is, is deemed as essential. Um, so they're just trying to tighten up a bit on the amount of people that are coming into brief committees, um, albeit when it comes to a bill, um, that's, that's kind of, will be treated a little bit differently. So it's just to bear that in mind, members, that over the next uh, week or two, um, for any other briefs that we want, or briefings that we want to have, um, we just have to be mindful as to whether we deem it essential or not. But that will be a decision that we'll um, all take. Um, and just uh, let me see, where am I? OK, yeah. Uh, just to let you know that we have done um, a proposed planning or a day to hold our second series of stakeholder events next Tuesday, the 26th, and the subject is universal credit and welfare mitigations. Um, it could be deemed non-essential that we have that because it is an extra meeting as well, albeit it's a, it's a, a more informal type of meeting. Um, so what I, I do think it's essential, though, that we do hear that briefing. Um, but what I was going to propose to members, if we could try it, and after hearing what Sinead has said, um, I'm a bit dubious to try it. But if we could try doing that even on MSM Teams on a virtual basis, rather than meeting in a room, um, I'm more than happy to, I mean, well, all, most of us anyway, not all of us, but a good lot of us will be here in the building on Tuesday anyway. So I'm happy enough to do it from my office up on 359. Um, so, and we'll do it via Teams. Um, are members any comments members want to make on that, or are they happy enough to, to, that we go ahead with that, Kelly? I was just going to say Microsoft Teams. Um, I know that we have to test this out. I'll, I'll try and do that on Monday. Um, hopefully, um, I'll be able to get it on the PC because if I try to use it in the Surface Pro Room 45, my office has basically no Wi-Fi in it, no mobile signal in it. Um, so I'll, I'll try my best to be there on Tuesday afternoon. If, if, it's, if I can get MT, Microsoft Teams working on, on the PC, I'll certainly be there. OK, I'd forgotten about that. We can only get then Zoom and Starleaf on our PCs, is that correct? And our PCs in our offices? Yeah, yeah, so Teams might not work for us then. Um, well, what about then, I, can I suggest that the clerks go and speak to IT to see what would be the best method? Of having that, I really don't want to cancel this on the twenty fifth. Um, though, if we if we have to, because of IT issues, we will, um, and we'll just we'll we'll reschedule it for maybe the week after the week after that, whatever. Um, so, can I leave that then with the clerks to go and have a look at that and get back to members then after the uh, the meeting yeah. as to what's the best way forward? Yeah, is that okay? All right. Um, let me see. What else have I got to do? Uh, yeah, yeah, I want to inform you that the Minister has agreed to brief the committee at the meeting on the 11th of February on the regional and sub-regional stadia programme for 30 minutes before the executive meeting. A request has been made for the Minister to brief the committee again at a meeting before the end of February. Can I ask members, are there any comments on that or are they content to note? Content to note? Yeah, okay. Um, members, at last week's meeting, we considered a departmental reply on the COVID Charities Fund Phase 2, and then we sent a letter asking if the department will be in contact with charities that were un unsuccessful in their applications to Phase 1 to advise that they were able to apply again. Um, since then, I had a very informative conversation with uh, an official, Joanna Gray, on uh, 
I think it was yesterday I had the conversation with her. Um, they have been in contact with many charities. They are encouraging charities to apply. We know the closing date, I think, is this Friday. Um, so she would be very keen um, to uh, offer us a briefing, whether that's a, an oral briefing or a written briefing. Um, to the committee just on how that second tranche of that of that money has has gone out. Um, I suppose we'll not know until after the close of play just how many charities um, have applied and how many have been successful or unsuccessful in the average amount of money. Um, so could our members, if they're in agreement, that we seek an oral briefing um, from Joanna and uh, and other officials um, at a time that you know that we think is, is the right time to do it when they have enough information to come forward to us remember there's been agreement to that yeah agreed yeah. chair can i yeah. <coughs> just ask you <coughs> in terms of what, what you gathered from, from from the briefing my understanding is that when the charities came to make their uh, presentation to us that their complaint, if that's the right word, was that they had been, or a number of them had been ruled out of gaining support because they had a parent body in GB that had reserves, but indeed that the Northern Ireland <coughs> charity was not, was an independent uh, and was not eligible, could not uh, actually touch in to those resources uh, in wherever. Uh, and is your understanding, Chair, that the Northern Ireland registered charities are now eligible for support uh, from, from the COVID-19 pot? This is the problem because they're not Northern Ireland registered charities, they're registered charities to England. Right. And that is still the case. I asked Joanna that, and that was my understanding from the conversation, that they're still not eligible to apply. That's that Article 167, I think it was. Um, so it's because they are registered as, they're not registered as Northern Ireland charities, and that is the problem because this article was never enacted. Um, so I'd asked her about that as well, and you know that that is something that certainly needs to be, to be put forward, and we need to get a briefing on that also. So we do so know that still remains the same. Now the charities that did have reserves that stopped them, they were eligible to apply, um, albeit there, there's still a little bit of um, uh, regulations around that, but they were still able to, they were able to apply, uh, but they were the Northern Ireland registered charities only. So there were. So, um, but I think we'll, if we get a further briefing on that, because there is still a disparity, and it is unfair because we do know when we heard from those various charities that they're not getting access to that money yes. from the, the the UK fund or from the fund over in GP, GB. Can, can, can I, ask, in, in terms of that, absolutely agree, Chair, and maybe we could uh, have an understanding of what the route out of the situation we're in to enable the. 167 or whatever the reference number is, charities to be able to secure support. Yeah, I think I've called it 168 and 165 and everything. That's un I'm nearly certain it's 167. Okay. So I am Andy. Whichever number it is. Okay, Andy. For, just firstly, uh, uh, declaring interest um, in respect to this item. Uh, and I agree with Robin. Um, can we go back to the department to see what type of workaround that they can try to put in place? Because, again, back to the point, we're in exceptional and extraordinary times, and surely we should be able to do something as an assembly to accommodate those organisations whose parent organisations are obviously GB, but they operate and provide very many services across the province here, uh, and their obviously resources have been impacted. The, the, the position has been obviously well laid out, but it, it could result in them um, being at a disadvantage in terms of being able to continue to deliver their services, many of those which are very much needed across our community, especially at this time. Okay, yep, thank you for that. Um, Kelly? Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, it's, it's something that actually we should be considering. Um, I know the 167 charities, the legislation hasn't been brought forward, as you've said yet, but we know that the department is looking at Concordat agreement with the community and voluntary sector. There is a concern for me about the lack of understanding about re what reserves are, um, and reserves and charities are, are very highly um, 
uh, met or are contained within the reserves policy. That reserves policy um, allows organisations to, to have money set aside for known liabilities. That would be things like redundancy, um, running costs for up to three to six months um, should funding fail for them. So it gives them time to actually close the organisation down in an appropriate manner. This is um, something that's guided by Companies House, especially for those organisations that haven't yet had Northern Ireland registration. And we know that there's plenty of organisations still sitting waiting for registration through the Charity Commission. Um, I would be quite keen if we could ask the department um, to provide us with an update on that Concordat agreement um, so that there can be at long last for all departments and all funders um, recognition that charities... If they don't have reserves, then they're not viable organisations. So to expect charities to spend reserves, that's a legal requirement for their boards of directors um, on, on government services, basically means that those charities are subsidising government as opposed to the other way around. So I think it would be useful if we were able to get a written update from the department on that. OK, happy enough with that, members, with all of those actions that um, members have asked. Yes, agreed? OK. That's grand. All right, then, members, we'll move on to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. Members, you'll, <coughs> excuse me, you'll find these at um, page seven of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, are you content to agree the minutes of the 14th of January 2021 as drafted? Yes. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. Just to say I'm down twice as being present. That's the only thing. OK. All right. OK, members. Um, then, um, are members happy to agree as amended? Great. Yes, yeah. great. OK, thank you. OK, members, we're going to move on to agenda item four, which is matters arising. Um, members, last week we had a very limited reply from the department on the delay of the commencement of the job start, start scheme and other labour market interventions, and we wrote back requesting more information. Um, members, it was uh, came as a surprise then at question time on Tuesday that we were made aware that the difficulties lay within finance for this programme and why it hasn't started. Um, I just suppose I, I, I'm a little bit annoyed at this, that after writing twice to the Minister and the Department to ask why this scheme had not progressed and had not started, and to receive answers just to say that there were issues uh, and that was delaying it. I don't think that's good enough that we as a committee, after writing twice, have to hear it. Um, as an answer at question time on Tuesday. Um, if this had not have been put down, or if someone had not have asked this question or this wasn't on the, the list of questions, um, we may not have, have, have heard this. Um, I, just, I, I spoke to the Minister last night. Um, she, she gave me a call last night to do with another issue, but I had mentioned it to her when I spoke to her last night as well to say that I'd be bringing it up in the committee. And, and, and mentioned to her also we're there to support her, not only to just scrutinise in this committee, but to support her in her role as well. And without full knowledge or hearing actually what is going on with many issues, we're unable to complete our job in that support as well. Um, you know, I just I, I just wanted that put on the record. We know that the, the scheme started in England back in the beginning of September. We're now almost five months down the line, and Northern Ireland people have not had the, the opportunity to avail of this scheme. Um, so I just want to put that on the record, and I want to ask the department... Um, as, a, as a matter of urgency, they need to give us a briefing on this and need to give us um, some sort of indication as to whether this money has been lost, whether this money can continue. Um, I think the committee, committee deserves that respect um, to know that. So, members, any comments on that, Andy? Yeah, sure. I would, I would certainly echo your comments. Um, I'm deeply disappointed at the approach in respect to this, certainly when the faces were in with ourselves uh, a number of weeks ago prior to Christmas. Um, there, there was no indication of there being uh, financial difficulties. Indeed, there was questions asked around the budget uh, and they outlined that. They outlined this year's budget. Uh, uh, this year's budget is, if I recall rightly, around about 0.8 million, uh, and the, the following year's budget in around 18 million pound mark. They at no point did they indicate to us that um, there was difficulties in respect of that. Um, they were very much outlining to us that they were very much rolling the sleeves up to get this scheme rolled out. And it's disappointing because I know I'm getting a lot of questions asking what on earth's going on when other regions of the United Kingdom are very much on their way with this very vital scheme uh, and we're not. And I do appreciate, obviously, the delays in respect of our restrictions, but to find out beyond that, obviously, it's financial. It was news to me. 
Thank you, Andy. Um, members, any other comments on that? Are they content that we ask for a briefing, a full briefing on that? Um, yeah? yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Thank you, members. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, sure, that, that would be in the critical. Area. That would be essential. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Um, members, you've been provided a page 17 with a reply from the National Museums NI in committee queries to the Model Engineers Society. Can I ask then, have members any comments on that? Uh, yeah, I knew you would. Um, Alex? I just, I don't know what more we can do. Um, I'd love to be able to do more. Um, I'm just disappointed by the response. I mean, the reasons why they're not allowed to stay, the wall garden is a key heritage asset. And we have a responsibility to ensure greater public value from it, particularly in relation to social impact. Well, that's what they're doing. <laughs> You know, and then the use of the site by the society is creating increasing operational challenges and risks. That's just a load of rubbish. And then it is increasingly difficult to justify continuing exclusive free access and use of a key part of the site. But that's a load of rubbish too. <laughs> so, you know, I, that, I mean, they pay for themselves and yeah. it's just bizarre, their attitude, and it's very disappointing. And, I would, I mean, I would agree with you. It is very dis disappointing as someone who knows the value of the model mm. railway and how much it, it it means, especially to many of those older folk <coughs> who have passed on their great knowledge of engineering to some of our young people. Um, you know, and it is, it's very disappointing that that is the answer that we have been given. But as you say, I don't know what more we can do as a committee mm. to assist with this. Kelly, you wanted to come in. I did actually. Um, I think it would be useful if we could pass um, a copy of this letter on to the, the the Model Engineers Society. I don't think any of it's going to come as a shock to to the guys who are involved with it. Um, it is what they have heard all along. Um, there is a few issues actually that that has come up this week. <coughs> excuse me, regarding questions. Um, there was a classic cars association had been asking for support that they wanted to, um, I can't remember exactly where it was, but they wanted to set up um, a museum that showed classic cars. And the minister in response in had Europe. said that she... That yes, Europe, so the minister it? in response had said that she hadn't had any notification of a request for such a, uh, an item. So I think we should maybe check with the Model Engineer Society to see if they have written to the minister to request um, a site um, for for the Model Engineers Society. I think that they have asked others and councils and so on, but have they actually asked the Minister um, and the Department about this? Um, the other thing about this is that the Model Engineers Society, I would be very interested in getting a, a cost from them of how much it's going to be to move. I know that there's an offer um, that, that there could be an extension to the period of time that they're going to be in Cultra, but that is really only to facilitate them to move. Um, I would be interested to find out how much it's actually going to be for them to lift themselves off the site. And while I appreciate that um, NMNI has said that they're not going to charge them to put this, the site back as it was originally, mind you, if there's anybody around that can remember what it was like before they, they went there, it would be a staggering. But um, this is going to be a lot of money for a, a voluntary organisation. Like you're talking about cranes and and lifting lines and lifting trains, I would say this is probably going to be in excess of £50,000. Um, and that, to be honest, bankrupts that organisation. So I would like to hear from them the costs, how much it would be to move, um, and if they have written to the minister to ask for a site for them to use. OK, Kelly, thank you for that. Um, members, any other comments? Um, no? OK, members, then are we in agreement? Um, with the proposals that are on the table. Sorry, I think when they were here... Clerk wants to say something. I think when they were here briefing, if they did mention the cost, if I remember rightly, it was higher than 50,000. Yeah, I think um, it was higher than 50,000. I think if we asked them for... 100,000, uh, yeah, I think they estimated. For those, uh, those questions that Kelly has, has put down there for exact costs and have they gone to the Minister and uh, the Department um, willing to help with this or relocate. Um, so we can do that. No, that's fair enough. Are members in agreement with that? Yes? Agreed. All right. Thank you, members. OK, we're going to move on to agenda item five, which is a departmental briefing on the SL1, the Local Government Capital and Accounting Coronavirus Amendment Regs NI 2021. Um, members, you'll find this at page 27 of your meeting pack. Um, the department proposes to make a statutory rule to make a technical amendment to the Local Government um, 
capital finance accounting regulations by extending the deadline for councils to set their budget for 2021-22 from um, the 15th of February to the 1st of March 2021. Um, the technical amendment is time limited and applies to the budget for 2021-22 only and the strategy rule would be subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. Um, members, you remember that this was on the agenda last week, and I asked for it to be brought back just for a little bit more information. Um, can I welcome Anthony Carleton and Jeff Glass to our meeting today? Um, Anthony, um, have you anything? Good morning. That, hi, are you? Good morning. Good morning. Um, anything that you want to brief us on, or do you just want me to ask a few questions, or what's that, what do you want to do here? No, 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 I, I'm, I'm quite happy, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the invite and uh, to yourself and yourself and members. I'm happy enough to take the questions here. The explanation, uh, as you've read it out, actually is, is better than the one I have in front of me. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's uh, simply it's a matter, sorry, just by, by background, um, it's in conjunction with uh, DOF colleagues that councils requested that the, they get slightly longer time to set their budgets this year because of the uh, the particular difficulties of arising from COVID, uh, so they, they want to move the, the the notification of the budget date back to the first of March to coincide with the setting of the uh, rates for twenty one twenty two. Okay, look, thank you for that. And Anthony, the reason why I brought it back was whenever Solace was in with us, they had asked for the regional rate and the district rate to be aligned, and I know from the minister's statement on Monday. That they mm -hmm. they have there's a the agreement now to freeze the regional rate. So I would assume that councils are a little bit more satisfied with with, with in hearing that, because um, that brings then that they are able to align then the rates together. Um, just to ask you, um, have you been speaking with Solace? And I know you have. I know you have a really good relationship with them. And I, I have heard very positive things back about that. And I have to say, you've you've done a good job there. Um, are they happy enough then with 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 the way the, the track that's that this is taken. Yes, they are. We we, we, uh, we speak with Solace and, and, and we had a couple of meetings even at, at the partnership panel yesterday and 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 Herb Sachs had a meeting with Solace on perhaps on Tuesday. We also consulted with Nilga uh, and uh, every every week we would speak with the local government finance officers. <clears throat> so yes, everybody's uh, uh, in, in agreement that that uh, to the move to the first of March. It would be very, very helpful for this year. Okay, just and, then, and as you say, the notification came out about the, the from from the Department of Finance, hopefully about rate setting for for the incoming year as well. Uh, the only the only other um, sort of question I want to ask you about is then the, the risk going forward for councils if councils then um, can come to um, a, a, a freeze on their district rates or as low as possible they can of any increase on their district rates they're, they're taking a little bit of a risk um, because we still know that they have a, a great reduction in their income they still have many staff on uh, with furlough and we don't know what the future holds none of us do um, none of us know that um, is there any guarantees there and I know that the conversations will continue um, long into this year with yourself and Solace and Nilga um, that uh, if they do do that they'll not end up in a situation of, of being you know almost in the in the red um, because they've taken that risk well the, the conversations will continue as to any loss of income and, and anything the assembly can do to assist with that I would assume. Yes, the, the uh, chair. Thank you. The 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 the, the, the onus is on um, councils and, and chief finance officers to, to set a balanced budget for the incoming year. <clears throat> and I appreciate that 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 there is a certain risk associated with um, council finances because it's highly unlikely that the you know, leisure centres and leisure parks w will open uh, uh, at the first of April. And everything will be back to normal. But I think I'm fairly, fairly confident we can take that uh, assumption. The, as you know, the, the budget is out for consultation. Um, currently, at the minute, uh, DOF colleagues are indicating that, that the, the amount available for um, COVID support uh, is, is well down on what was available this year. But we're continuing to liaise with DOF and speaking to Solace and uh, our finance colleagues in local government. On, on a weekly basis to try and get a bit more assurity as we move on. So, 
we can't say that we can't give a commitment, uh, um, but certainly there are, there are very close working relationships, um, and we're, we're in, in certainly weekly, if not two or three times a week, contact with with councils regarding finance. Okay, look, thank you. I'm I'm satisfied um, with <clears throat> that. Um, any other any members have any questions they want to ask around this issue? No. No, nope. okay. Um, that's great. Look, thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I suppose hearing on Monday the, the finance minister's um, decision around the, the um, freeze on the regional rate, uh, if we had maybe had that, if I'd have known that maybe before the meeting, we wouldn't have asked you to come back in, but we didn't. And look, I'm really glad that you did come in, and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <clears throat> Okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item six, um, which is raised papers on the licence and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, for future information in relation to the licence and bill, RAISE has provided two briefing papers at page 35 and 41. The first paper provides additional information as requested by the Committee on Local Licensing Forums in Scotland. The second provides notes on the webinar attended by Eleanor Murphy on behalf of the Committee um, the Institute of Public Health North South Al Alcohol Policy Advisory Group webinar on alcohol-related harms in nightlife settings on the island of Ireland on the 3rd of December 2020. Are members content to note those raised papers? Yep, content. Can I hear you? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item seven, which is Lakata Brewery briefing on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, members, you'll find these papers at page 54 of your meeting pack. And then can I welcome to the meeting Roger Dockerty, <coughs> Laurie Davis, and Earl. I'm sorry, I'm not going to even embarrass myself by trying to pronounce your surname, because I would be embarrassing myself. Um, can, Roger, Earl and Laurie, you are all very welcome to the meeting. And Roger, could I ask then you if you want to um, begin your brief? All right, Roger, we can't hear you. You check if you're on mute, just. Problems. <laughs> we love we, we just have constant IT problems in our community. <laughs> so we do. And I'm not going to mention anybody's name. Um Roger, do you want to try talking again to see if we can hear you? No, we can't hear Roger. Oh dear, okay. Um Maybe we start with Laurie, will we? And then yeah, by the time that, that the intro is yeah. there. Yep, Earl, that's right. Laurie, do you want can to Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Great. <laughs> um, my name's Laurie Davis, I'm the head brewer at Lakada Brewery. Um, Lakada has been in existence since 2014, um, we've been at market since October 2015. Um, it's good to be back here. Um, I was here in 2016 providing evidence to the communities uh, committee on the very subject. It looks uncannily like the same room. Um, yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Earlier that year, I'd also been at a meeting hosted by Lockery College, which brought together cider producers, um, spirit distillers, and the microbreweries based in Northern Ireland um, to discuss the barriers to our, to our trade um, posed by the lack of a producer's license. And the MLA who spoke at, initially at the meeting said, um, that until he was invited to speak, he had no idea we had a brewing industry in Northern Ireland, um, and we most certainly do have a thriving homegrown industry here. So when um, we were uh, with you in 2016, we had um, Michelle Fairley from Food NI, um, Tim, who was the chairman of Camera at the time, and Helen from our Mass Cider Company, um, and the committee agreed to our recommendations for the producer's license. Um, so it's been four years since then, um, and we do desperately need government to aid our brewing industry to reach its market. What we want to do this morning is um, we want to aid the committee. Um, so we want to talk about three things, um, explain um, what tap rooms are, um, our experience of running them, um, why we need them, 
clear up misconceptions about them. Um, number two, we want to clear up some misconceptions about our products and our routes to market. And number three, we, we want to explain what the producer's license means for us and what happens if we don't achieve it fully. So each of us will cover these topics and welcome questions starting with myself. Uh, Lakada has run a number of tap rooms in our brewery for the past three years. Um, what this involves is um, moving stock around, um, getting an area, uh, creating space, setting up a bar, usually about four taps, and we serve our own beer. The beers are often one-offs, they're specials, they can be child beers that we may or may not go to brew into a bigger way for general release. Um, the craft beer market's um, very quick moving. Um, they always want to see a new beer. So this gives us a great, um, a great place to meet the customers. Um, so people who attend are always looking for new beers and they're really keen to find out about the beer and about the brewery. And this is a really essential part of the tap room experience so the public get to talk and meet with the people who make the beer. Um, that's the real value for, for it with them and for us. We open the tap room usually from about 2 p.m. and we close at 9 p.m. And so there's no TV, um, there's no music, there's no food served on premises, there's no happy hour, there's no buy four pints for three, there are no spirits served and there's no wine. It's about as far removed from a public house environment as you, as you could think. It's, it's, it's not a pub by any other name. Um, it's more akin to a noisy library. Um, at this point, I'd like to point out we've never received a single complaint from our ta about our tap rooms from our residential neighbours. We've never received a complaint from our public houses, hotels and off licences. In fact, the opposite happens. Those in the hospitality trade report an increase in footfall because of people travelling to our tap rooms. This is really important. Um, your microbreweries here are spread um, across Northern Ireland. Um, people will go to brewery tap rooms. Um, Errol's going to talk about this a bit more, but across the world, people travel to tap rooms. Um, the footfall is re reflected in our tap rooms and more significantly when we ran the annual Port Rush Beer Festival in the town hall. Um, the first year we ran the festival, the shops in the town were saying it was the busiest day of the season um, and that's in October. When we run our tap rooms, we do so in a responsible manner and we inject trade into the hospitality sector. Those things are really, really important to us. What is important to us about tap rooms, it gives us to a root market with our draft beer. The microbreweries in Northern Ireland are stymied at getting their beers on taps in this part of the world. It's actually a scandal. If you go to Dublin and as a microbrewer, you feel like weeping. Um, in fact, you go to any large town in the Republic and you feel like weeping. There's local craft beer on tap all over the place. And here we are locked out of the draft trade. It's pure and simple as that. And it's not because our beers are too strong. We as brewers rely on producing sensible strength beers. Our staple, our best seller at Lakata, is 4.5%. All the microbreweries in Northern Ireland do session 4.5% beers. Um, we are locked out of the draft trade because the macrobreweries have a lock on the bars. Now, this can take the form of monthly discounts on kegs, takes the form of cellaring services, which is looking after your um, dispense systems, your chillers. We've experienced um, when we put a tap in bars, um, there have been reps from the macro saying to the owners, take that Lakata tap off or we'll stop your discounts. This is the sort of thing that we are up against. We microbrewers are probably going to market in bottles and cans because we cannot access the market through draft product to the extent that we would like. Having our own tap rooms gives us the access to the market. It allows us to serve our beer with our cellaring knowledge and it allows us to meet our customers. Things have changed in the marketplace um, and they've moved very quickly in, even in the five years we've, we've been in operation. I know Errol's going to expand on this in a minute, but um, my halfpenny worth is um, what is in, in place isn't working well. It isn't fit for purpose. It's damaging your homegrown producers. We cannot expand 
and grow, and we can't employ more people unless we can sell our product ourselves with a full producer's license, and um, we need your help. Harold? Okay, Laurie, thank you, Harold. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Paula. And um, hello to all the committee members. Uh, so my name is Errol Butchukola, and I am chairman of LACADA's board of directors. Um, I've been involved with LACADA for five years now in one way or another. Um, and I'm, I'm proud not only of the business we've developed, um, but more importantly, the community that we have built. We are a cooperative business and we have over 400 co-owners and there are more new members joining every couple of days. Our members come from across the community, near, far, male, female, young, old, but all keen to get involved in a small local enterprise. It's a symptom of changing times and one that I consider to be a very positive change. There is a definite shift in the way that people want to spend their valuable time and hard earned money. People want to seek out locally made produce rather than macro produced products. They want to find something special rather than to be told what to eat or drink by the big corporations. Importantly, Northern Ireland has embraced this transition with food and drink tourism, the fastest growing sector, attracting more and more people to Northern Ireland. Normally in the pre-world, pre-COVID world, we host many tours all year round from the USA, from Asia, from Europe, all keen to learn about Lakata, to learn about our story and to try our beer, to try something different. And that's the key. Unfortunately, when they come, they have a tour, they have a chat. All we can do is give them a mouthful of beer when they visit, which I've got to say they find absolutely ridiculous. So food and drink tourism is crucial to the Northern Ireland economy and to our long-term sustainability as a brewery. Excuse me if I'm going on just a little bit too long, but I do want to share just a bit of insight, personal insight, because I am one of those food and drink tourists. Whenever myself and wife choose to go and spend a long weekend somewhere, I'll select a country or a city or a town based on the availability of tap rooms. We've been to Reykjavik, Oslo, Santa Rosa, Boston, Manchester, Cork, Sligo, Madrid, a whole host of countries and cities. And, and the, the, that list is growing all the time. And when I'm there, I spend money. I stay in hotels, I buy goods, I try local produce, I visit the sites, and importantly, I also visit the local pubs. The beer tourist is a high value tourist and tap rooms attract them. Why is that? Well, instead of drinking six pints of lager or Guinness, you'd maybe have a flight of five beers. Now, a flight is five glasses, each of them about maybe 200 milliliters, and each one of them will be a different style or a different type of beer, but each of them will be an amazing flavor experience, something that you've never had before. Believe it or not, there are hundreds of different beer styles out there. It's not just lager and Guinness, which is the only thing that you seem to find on taps in Northern Ireland. These are all carefully made by the local brewer. Who you'll maybe get a chance to meet and talk to. The beers are also often paired with locally produced artisan foods, and that creates a harmonized food and drink experience. This is not pint culture. This is not pint guzzling. It's responsible drinking. It's about quality over quantity. As Laurie said, there are no TVs, there's no sport. It's a different culture and it's catering for people seeking different experiences. And to be honest, that's why craft beer doesn't work for a lot of today's pubs. And that's why, you know, a lot of them, you know, for Laurie's mentioned some of the reasons why they don't stock them, but it just doesn't work for those organizations who have built their business on shifting lager at £3.80 a pint. And that's why it's so important that we need to be able to control our own destiny and be able to sell our own produce. Because if we can't, then we can't survive. And I've got to say that would be a great shame for us, the community and the wider tourist industry in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. Errol, Roger, you're back with us again. Is there anything you want to add to that? Oh, 
I still can't hear Roger. No, Roger, we're still not getting your <coughs> volume. Um, so we aren't. Um, I know, I think you did go out and come in again there. Um, I maybe have to try that one more time. It, just the joys of doing remote meetings, I'm afraid. Um, so, Roger, do you want to try going out and coming back in again? And we'll continue on, just, and hopefully you can join us with a bit of sound. Yeah? Okay. Um, members, I, I, just, I think we'll just press on, because we know that we're tight for time anyway. Um, so we are. But um, I just want to then um, ask a few questions. And I know certainly from what Laurie was saying there about um, the, our, our, bars, our, our, our bars and restaurants, um, stocking craft beers. We had a briefing, I don't know whether you had opportunity to listen to it or not, from Hospitality Ulster our, uh, last week. And um, they had said in that briefing that there were many of our bars that did have um, taps um, with craft brewery um, with beer and also had the bottles. Um, they also had said that they had felt that tap rooms would be a direct competitor to our, our pubs. And also one of the members did say that he would no longer stock craft beers from small producers in the future if tap rooms do become law. Can I just ask what your views would be on those? Um, we supply um, five bars. There was five independent bars with a large on top. And the, so, how, how many is that out of, Laurie? How many independent bars do we have in Northern Ireland? Do you know? Would you would you know that? No, I wouldn't. No, but five okay. is um, a very small very percentage. Small percentage. Okay, okay. And what about the issue then, where they say that they they think that tap rooms would be a direct competitor to them? Um, did they provide any evidence, or is that just an opinion? Okay, I know certainly from what uh, you were saying, it is, a, and certainly what Errol was saying, it is a very different experience a tap room. Um, and I suppose is that I mean is that would be one of the answers to that, Earl? Do you want to even come in well, on that? Yeah, can I can I just just say say a couple of things there? I mean, it's very important to you know when a bar says they're stocking craft beer, the question is how are they stocking it? What we're talking about is draft beer, being able to go in and get a beer poured into your glass from a tap. There are brewer, there are pubs that sell our beer, um, and they'll sell it in cans. Um, but that will be in a fridge hidden away somewhere at the back of the bar. And they're not, they're, they're not really keen to sell it. It'll just be a case of, I'm going to stock a few cans just to tick a box in case somebody comes in actually looking for it. And as, and as far as being competition, I don't see it as competition. We are a very different product and tap rooms are a different product serving a very different market that pubs can't serve today. And as, a, as I've said, people come to an area to go and visit the tap rooms, and then they go on to visit the pubs. If you look at the Port Rush Beer Festival, it's a great example, and Laurie's mentioned it. The craft beer is bringing people into the town of Port Rush, into the area, and while they're there, they go to the other facilities that are, that are nearby as well. So I don't see it as competition. I actually think it enhances and helps develop the business for pubs as well. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Earl, I don't know, Roger, are you back with us again? Can we try you again? No, we've still no sign from Roger. Roger, I'm sorry, I don't know what has happened here this morning. Um, I just uh, want to press on and ask another question. Um, in your submission, you outlined three options for change to the bill um, to open the market up for small producers. One was by abolishing the surrender principle Another was creating provision within the producer's license to allow for sale of alcohol uh, for consumption on site. And another was an amendment to ensure licensed premises sell beers from multiple breweries on tap. Can I just ask, out of those three, which route do you feel would be the most effective? So, Laurie, do you want to answer that or why? Well, I was hoping that Roger would be able to answer that one. I'm afraid we can't hear Roger, so one of you, mm -hmm. one of you two is going to have to answer it. 
I think it's critical that we can sell our product on uh, site. You know, um, we have to be in control of our own destiny, and the only way that we can is to be able to sell it on site. Um, I think it's really important that we can sell our own product, and it's the product that we um, make in collaboration with other breweries. So quite often, two, three, four breweries will get together and they'll make a make a beer together, and those would also need to be included in what we can sell. Okay. All right. Um, so that that second option then seems to be if if there was only one route available and that would be the one that you would feel would be most effective. Yeah, we need to be able to sell it on sales and we need to be able to sell um, for people to as an off license as well for people because you get a lot of tourists, they come and they want to buy our product and we have to point them to, to some other business somewhere else in the time that may or not be open or they may or not may not have stock. People want to come and they want to get gifts and they want to get gifts from the brewery. Okay, okay. Thanks, Earl, for that. I'm going to open up to members now. Um, I have Robin. Go ahead, Robin. Thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank the members uh, for uh, meeting with us uh, this morning. I have just a couple of simple uh, questions. Can I just ask, first of all, are we, am I right that there are only five craft brewers in Northern Ireland? There's 35, I think, is the figure. And there are only five that are a member of your association? Siba? Uh, I mean, we're here as Lakata Brewery. Oh, you're only a, sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm going too far ahead then. You're on the next wave. I'm, I'm, I'm going too far ahead. My, okay. my apologies for that. Okay. Um, can I ask then, in, in terms of the support that you get uh, from the Department of the Economy for the establishment of the business, um, do you get or are you recognised by the tourism uh, tourism and I as a tourist attraction. It, yeah, we are. We are a tourist uh, attraction. We we work very closely with uh, the tourist organisations in Northern Ireland. Okay, and and in in their tourism offer, would they be promoting your organisation as a, a must see venue, a venue to go to? No, they can't really at the moment because um, because we're not licensed to sell. Um, what we would like to do is have a full Northern Ireland brewery tour um, where you can get a full tourist experience, come and visit us and buy on the premises. Um, we run independently. Um, we do get a lot of support from... Uh, Food NI and Tourism NI, um, and they link us up with um, visitors and tours and food writers. Um, but there is a world of opportunity there um, to make up uh, a brewery tour of Northern Ireland. Um, if that answers you, Robin, yeah. is that and, what you're looking for? And, and in the establishment of your business, were the Department of the Economy supporting you? Not directly, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you, Rob. Uh, members, no one else has, si sorry, Andy has signalled next to come in, but just to notify our, uh, the members on Starleaf, if any of you want to ask a question, will you please press your hands up button? Oh, there we go, Mark's heads up already. So, Andy and then Mark. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just, just one question at this point. Um, other brewers in the past have highlighted to us um, the number of days and hours that they feel in order to make their tap room viable, and I know you've outlined that to an extent. Um, what do you feel would be the bare minimum, and what would you like to see as a, as a, a maximum? Um, well, the maximum open um, whenever we wish, um, be it every afternoon, but a, a minimum. Um, would be for us uh, every week, every you know. What what, what sort of hours? Well, as I say, we operate from uh, two to nine pm. When we do it, we've done a few. We use an occasional license. Um, it's a cumbersome process to go through. So, so, so you would like to see a situation where you get to two to nine pm every day of the week and weekends. Um, is there any type of model where, for example, the enhancement of those occasional licences would, would be a viable uh, alternative? 
No, I don't think so, no. I think we'd like to have have it, have it in our, our own hands. Um, I mean, we've done them in a very responsible manner, as I highlighted. Um, so we just like to have control of, of what we can do. Okay, sorry, sure, just one more. Um, it, and I was wondering... Just kind of, uh, enhance on, on what Laurie said there. It, it's really important that we, we have control over, you know, what we can do and when we can sell it. I mean, at the minute we sell until 9 p.m., but I think a, a, a proper time to be open till, has got to be until about 11 o'clock. Um, you know, we've, we've used the occasional license process and it, it just doesn't doesn't work. It's okay if you just want to have an event the odd time, but um, it's not a process that's suitable for a business. It's not something that a business can invest on the back of. Okay, and just, just one further question, Chair. Um, and I know I was on the committee previously um, in 2016-17, uh, and I do know, just, just for a refreshment, can you, can you detail uh, the process again for us uh, in setting up a... Uh, a brewery in that respect, how difficult is it? What is the registration process? Uh, who do you have to register with? What's the safeguards, etc.? You have to um, register at HMRC um, and apply for producer's license. You have to have an interview with HMRC um, for that and for the AWRC license. Um, so in a way you're vetted. You have to have a business plan for them to see. They we then have to keep um, records of uh, everything we produce, everything we throw away. Um, you know, our businesses like doing their VAT returns. We do VAT returns, obviously, um, but every month we have to sit down and work out the beer juicy. Um, the brewery business is um, sort of a bit unique like that. Um, so we have to work out um, and keep records of. Uh, not just how much beer we sell, but how much of each type and basically how much alcohol goes over the premises, um, Andy. So it's uh, it's pretty rigorous. Um, and I think I know perhaps where, where your, your concern is. Um, thinking of setting up a business um, and um, being able to run uh, a tap room by starting a brewery, um, you'd start looking at that um, the expenses um, alone would put you right off. Um, it, it, you need a lot of money to start up a brewery. You need to hit a lot of volume before you start making money. The margins on it aren't great. I know for a fact that where we are in Port Ash, um, uh, someone with a pub license did look at our premises before us. Uh, um, and walked away because the margins just weren't right. Um, so if someone's thinking, well, I'm going to set up a, a tap room and uh, I'll set up the brewery and get a tap room and I'll, I'll get I'll get served in that way, it, it, it's it's not viable. Um, it, you wouldn't do it. Um, but does that answer your question about um, what it takes to set up a brewery? Yeah, no, absolutely. I just wanted uh, a refresher on that. And obviously, we have information pertaining to that from the previous sessions back in the, the previous evidence uh, sessions. So we can look to that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy. Um, Roger, do you want to see if we can hear you again? No, still can't hear, Roger. So we can't hear <laughs> ah, Sorry about that. Um, I have then Mark, Sinead, and then Kelly. So, Mark... You still can't. You still can't see me. It's like you see no evil, no evil, maybe between me and Roger. Uh, thank you, uh, guys, for the presentation. I have to declare, and I'm just here again, uh, Chair. Yeah. It's becoming a recurrent theme. Uh, in, in terms of the presentation, now we've heard from a number of, of brewers and brewers representatives, and, and I think it's fair to say there's a, 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 a large degree of sympathy uh, among committee members and the desire to do something uh, to address this issue and to maximise the potential of our local brewers, not just your your potential, but the potential that your industry has to, to bolster our tourism product and, and help the local economy. We have obviously more recently heard from people opposed 
uh, the, the some of the proposals coming from your industry. You spoke there, Laurie, you were talking about in response to a question from Andy about the the money required to start a brewery. Now, one of the issues that had been raised by Hospitality Ulster or some of their members or representatives last week was the issue of rates. Does your industry recognise that by changing or, or should licences be granted for tap rooms to open, that you will be subject to a whole new sort of area of regulation and rating, you know, and there will undoubtedly, in my view, uh, be increased financial cost to that as well. Yes, absolutely, Mark. Yeah, we've looked at that um, and we've factored that cost in um, and we are aware that there have been um, regulations pertaining to that um, and the rates would be different as well. Um, but that's grand. Okay, well, yeah, no, it's, it's an, and some, not every business in your line of business will be in the same place, do, do you know, either financially, and, and not everyone will want to do that, or, do you know, some might be put off by by the increased costs, do you know, they might not know if it will be viable or, or, or worth their while to, to, to go down this route, should this route be open. Uh, uh, just picking up on another point, other members had, had, had focused on the tap room issue, but in your response or your submission, you're clear that you'd like to see the bill amended to enable non licensee event organisers apply for a licence for major events. I was just wondering, could you get a wee bit more detail on that? I mean, do you envisage an annual cap on the number of such licences, or would you accept additional requirements? for an organiser to obtain such a licence that an existing licensee may be subject to as well? Unfortunately, Roger has the detail on that. We can't hear him. I, uh, it, 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 it's no biggie, I suppose, in terms of what you hear. And, and, and like I say, I was just sort of widening it, it, it out. But uh, the chair touched there, actually herself, on and I think you did in response here, on how allowing tap rooms could actually benefit pubs. I think that's something we have to also look at more And in order for you to, to sell it to your opponents. Uh, so to say, I, I, I do believe, and I mean, they have evidence elsewhere across these islands and beyond that coexistence <laughs> is possible. You know, but it, it's how you can derive mutual benefit. And have you any more ideas how that might be done? Yeah, um, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't use the word opponents. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's room for everybody, um, Mark. I, I think that's. I think the issue issue there that, that you're touching on is. Um, Look, there's been a status quo for a long time, and, and the craft beer has come along. And um, I think with the macros, uh, there's a fear they're going to lose market share. Um, what has happened with our experience is, um, and we get this quite a lot um, from bar owners, is, um, well, well, the macros... Um, the rep paint, you know, you can't put that on because it's take it, taken away from our sales. That, that doesn't happen in the bars when, yeah. when, when we have a tap on. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a certain sector of the customers coming in, into bar will buy craft. Um, uh, but the, overwhelmingly, they will buy the macro. Um, uh, there's a coexistence that is happening but can happen to a much greater extent. Um, it, it, we're not a really a threat. We're um, we're a challenge, yes, because of the product we make. Um, but you know, there's there's plenty of room for the coexistence. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and and to focus on, you mentioned their threat, and you prefer to see yourself as maybe a, a challenge. But I think we have to start looking at the in terms of an opportunity as well uh, and I think it's very important that we do that and uh, as we go through this process that's something I'd very much like to, to, to thrash out with, with all parties involved but uh, yeah, thank you I agree, it's why I, I said that 
that, that there, there are some misconceptions. That's what I said at the very beginning, Mark. Um, and I, I think it's, it's very clear to, to use misconceptions and misunderstandings. And that's why we've, we, we've come along to sort of help the committee. And actually, um, yes, I did watch, um, uh, I did watch uh, the, the depositions uh, from, from hospitality. Um, and I, I felt we should, we should be talking across the table to each other. You know, um, there's plenty we can do together. Yeah. I, I could just add a couple of work words there, Mark and Laurie. I mean, beer is a very, very broad and wide market. I think the macros would have you believe literally everybody drinks lager, but is that, that is absolutely not the case. And there's a very broad and diverse market. And with any broad and diverse market, there are different products that meet those different needs. So there are pubs that will only ever sell macro because that's all their customers want. And there's the other end where craft pubs or maybe tap rooms will only sell to those types of customers, but there's a big overlap in that Venn diagram. Um, and there is a place for, for all of us to, to work and coexist together. And, and I think the pubs that have started stocking proper craft beer, um, and, and I just, I will define that um, slightly <laughs> differently. The ones that have started to, to stock proper craft beer will see different, probably more higher value customers coming into their shops. And it's a, it's a learning process that they will work through. And when I define proper craft, these are proper, truly independent breweries like Lakada. There are other um, kind of pseudo independent craft breweries who are actually heavily backed by the macro organizations. So some pubs may tell you or present that they're stocking craft beer, but they're not really. They're just stocking a product that's been heavily backed by a macro producer. Um, so it, it's it's not the same. It's very different. Yeah. So Earl, could I just pick you up on one thing? You, know, you spoke of a higher value customer. Just wonder, could you expand on that? I mean, how would you define that? Um, I guess uh, there's a difference between, you know, just going in and buying, you know, three pound fifty, three eighty um larger, like one, two, three, four, five, six pints of them, to actually buying something that is of, of higher cost. So, you know, I talked earlier about a flight of beer where you'll be having five different glasses, each maybe 200 milliliters, but the cost of those will be higher. So they'll be spending mm -hmm. more whenever they're in the premises. Yeah, well, it goes back to the opportunity thing there, doesn't it? Yeah. But no, th thank you, guys. Thanks for that. I'll let other members take it on now. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm just going to, just at this point, say to Roger as well, Roger, if there's anything, I'm sure you're taking notes as you go along here as well, if there's anything you feel that you want to add to this briefing afterwards, please just put it in, in writing and send it through to us. Um, we don't want to, to lose your voice in this as well. So just to add that in to yourself, Roger. Um, Sinead, I've got Sinead, then Kelly, and then Alex. So Sinead. I just wanted to, Mark actually made my point, but maybe just to expand on it, because I, I made the point um, last week when we had hospitality and that actually um, tap rooms could complement um, traditional public houses uh, in terms of once that cut off time at nine or ten or whatever it may be, uh, that that footfall would then follow through on to the, to the traditional bars. Um, and that point was contested um, by, by one of the um, attendees at the committee saying that they probably wouldn't um, allow entry to, they would have their, their uh, door staff wired off that if somebody was coming from a tap room that they probably would deny them entry because of the strength of the beers and they, they, they could see maybe, uh, you know, some antisocial, possible antisocial behaviour um, as a result of that. So maybe you could just you know, respond to that point. Um, and also the, a, a point that's come up time again um, throughout these uh, these sessions is the fact that, yes, while the, the point of tap rooms is to for you, for you guys to promote your local produce, um, but that other types of beverages could slip in. Uh, so in terms of wine or, or um, ciders or other types of, of beers outside your own, your own uh, produce. Um, so how, how do you see us, you know, putting the heel on that one and just allaying those those fears? Um, I'll take the first one, I'll, I'll take the second. Um, you know, um, the easiest answer to the first one would be our track record with Portrush Beer Festival. Um, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, 
committee members have been in support of town hall um but you know we packed that out about 150 people um over a weekend um do friday and saturday and uh there's not been um one single complaint from the police and not one single complaint from the public houses and the hotels and um i'm sorry um but the the what you heard last week was just just um plain wrong um can understand perhaps where it's coming from but it's not what we have found um and as, as i said in my short presentation um with the tap rooms that we run um we've never had a single complaint either and we are very careful about that we are very careful um we have the cut off time and that's that and you're at please leave and don't be gathering outside making noise um we police it um <laughs> we're very much aware of it um absolutely um errol did you want to take the second yeah um, and just to get to add to that that's definitely one of the misconceptions that's been presented that it's all high strength beer it's not true we make beers down two percent three percent four percent whatever people want and when it moves to maybe a higher abv they're actually served in much smaller servings um uh, because i mean think about it you know you, i don't know if you drink beer you, you may drink wine but you never think of filling a pint full of red wine you know you just just wouldn't do it because it's a higher strength so some of our beers are served very much like wine and i think that's probably the closer correlation to what we're actually trying to do and sell um, than what the current thought of what a pub is it's, it's very different on the other producers um products our goal is is to sell our products that that's what this is all about we we want we need a producer's license to sell our products we're not asking to sell other people's products the only kind of overlap as i've mentioned is collaboration um beers or products that we may work with other breweries to make but our name will be on it and we, we will have been involved in the manufacturer and if you wanted to to regulate it you know maybe it, it's clear that that we are involved in the in the production of that um, of that drink that we sell. Yeah, no, thank you. That's that's been very useful um, in terms of uh, the res the response to those. Um, th those contentions. Um, yeah, no. Listen, the, the committee's probably sick of, of me telling this yarn, but you know, I, we have a, a very good local brewery here where I am, uh, Moore Mountain uh, Brewery, and you know, we, um, you know, I, I visit them, I've visited them, visited them lots of times, been at their various tap rooms, um, and you know, it is very sad that we have the potential to have a. a a really good uh, food and drink um, tourism product here around Carningford Lock. Um, but again, you know, we have to be mindful that we do have other traditional bars here too. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I don't know if it was yourself, Errol or Laurie, in terms of that conversation needs to be had with the more traditional um, bars uh, that this can, you know, there can be a working relationship here um, and maybe just dispel some of those misconceptions that keep cropping up time and again. But listen, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay. I just can I just add to that is that um, the tap rooms aren't all in 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 the city, um, the breweries aren't all in the city. The, we are a rural country, um, and the breweries are are spread across the north. Um, so if you're coming to a tap room in more Mines, if you're coming to a tap room to see Beer Hut and Kill Kill, if you're coming to Lakada at Portrush, you'll be travelling to the tap room, and you're going, generally going to be staying. Um, and that's what we find with our tap rooms. They come up on the train. They might come up. From Valamina and stay in the hotel. Um, so um, they're coming for an experience, um, and they're not coming um, to get loaded for the night um, and go home. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense, um, it, 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 the, the breweries, the breweries are, are spread far, far and wide. You know, um, so. Um, I hope, I hope that answers that a bit better. Yeah, that's perfect, Dory. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on then to Kelly. Thank okay. you, Chair. Um, I hope you can hear me because I think somebody else has controlled my microphone at the moment. Um, 
Thank you very much, um, gentlemen, for your, your presentation. I just wanted to go back to something that Andy had mentioned earlier. Can you clarify for me, because there is concern out there that um, a home brewer or a pub could set up something in the corner. Um, can you confirm for me the definition of a brewery? What's the difference between a home brewer and a brewery? Is there a volume, a quantity? What's the, what's the variance there? You have to... Um register for producer's license with HMRC um, and you have to give them a volume um, forecast, an annual volume forecast each year. Um, so um, to, the point is how viable as a business are you going to be? Um, and to be viable as a brewery business, you, you do need um, a significant amount of kit and a significant amount of volume to go out. Um, so if you want to set up with a home brewer, um, on a 20 litre home brewing kit, you're, you, you, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible on 100 litres, it's impossible on 200 litres. You're, you're going to need to start a brewery um, at the very minimum of 400 litre brewery kit and you'll be working flat out um, and your fingers will be worn to the bone. Um, and there was not enough days in the week for you to do what you want to do. Um, so um, I hope that, does that help you? Uh, to be honest, I'm trying to sort of satisfy myself that there would be, um, you know, you can imagine that pubs don't want someone to come in and set up a pub in the city centre through the back door by claiming to be a brewery um, and having a tap room. So I'm trying to sort of satisfy that there has to be enough of a production um, involved Absolutely. with the brewery, yeah, to yeah. make it that, so it's not just a pub with something added on. Yeah. It actually has to be yeah. within. Yeah. The breweries could help you set a volume on that. And if you go across to the breweries in Northern Ireland, we could give you a figure between us all and say, look, this is what we regard as the average figure volume-wise that's needed. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in the, the current proposals of the legislation, the local producer's licence, um, it says here that a local producer's licence shall not authorise the sale of intoxicating liquor unless it is produced in the production premises. Earl, I'm quite keen to sort of to tease out um, this sort of multi-brewery multi approach. You know, how, how does that work and how will that fit into that part of the legislation? Um, I haven't thought of those particular words, but the way that collaborations happen are in many different ways. You know, um, we've done a collaboration with, with Beer Hub. We've done a couple of them um, where we have gone down to their premises um, and we have grew together. So we've developed the recipe together. We've gone through the brewing together. And more importantly, we've actually shared the costs of actually producing the beer. And then we take, we took half of the product each. Uh, in the COVID times, we have done a collaboration where we're actually separate uh, and we've brewed our own beer on our own premises. But the recipe, the name, the, how the label looks, the ABV, that was kind of all agreed together. Um, so there's, 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 there's different models, but we're, we're definitely both involved in the production of the beer. Okay, it's just if, if, if there's parts of the legislation that we can certainly see moving forward, but um, if we're going to talk about it being produced in the production premises um, for it to qualify, I, I just would be concerned that what does, what does produced in the production premises mean? Is it wholly or partly? Yeah, so it's something that I would be a bit concerned about. Um, Chair, I just have another couple of questions here. Um, so you've talked about your relationship with pubs and you've, you've spoken to us about why occasional licences wouldn't necessarily work. Um, you've also explained if the current proposals go forward, the impact on the future of your businesses. Um, you were talking there about selling your own produce only. I'm quite keen to, to examine that because one of the concerns that we have heard from other from pubs and hospitality is that um, it would be, as you have tried to explain, or you have explained to us, um, that what you're offering a tap room is very different to a pub. Um, are you consent then where it's set, content then where it says in the current um, legislation that it's only the sale of that intoxicating liquor that's produced in your premises and um, that no other offer would be able to be made then? That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have enough yeah. with that then. Obviously, under this licensing, it doesn't include soft drinks, but um, you're happy enough that it wouldn't be a case that somebody could come along and one, say there's a group there, some of them have your beers and some of them are looking for something else, like a glass of wine or something, that that wouldn't be available. 
it's happened with us in, in our tap rooms um, and um, to the patient explain, no, it, it's not wine here. You, you're going to have to go to a pub. Similarly, you got the rugby on this afternoon? Uh, no, we haven't got an entertainment license and it's a tap room. If you want the rugby, and we tell them where the local bars are, are the best place to go and watch the rugby um, and, and drink their pint of Guinness. Um, so they would stay and have, you know, a couple of hours um, and then they're off to watch the rugby or, um, you know, there was somebody who wants wine, they'll have to, they both have to leave and drink drink the wine. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, I just wanted to check with you as well. Um, it's already been brought up about the rates because the, the change of business um, going from just being a producer to actually selling on site will change the rates. But I'm just thinking about your own business. So I want you to have a think about me, the percentage of the current market that you have and if you're allowed to then sell your own produce um, closed or open on site, um, what impact do you think that's going to have to your business? What, what, what's the sort of percentage of growth that you could see happening if you're allowed to do that for your production? And will that sort of have a big change on what is called a local brewer and make you into something more? Or do you still see that as being a small, a smaller uh, production? Uh, it's... Uh, could it, could it it's, double it production, be, for instance? It can be six or one and a half dozen. Yeah, it would depend on... Um, you'd have to sit down, write the business plan, work out what distinct area of the brewery you would operate as tap room, the overheads on that and then what we would get through the door. And sometimes uh, that's a finger in the air, um, you know. Uh, and also with us, there's a seasonality, obviously, um, which we, we are tied into. Um, it's, it's a difficult different. one to answer, Kelly. It's a difficult one. Um, I'm just thinking with that change to the business purpose and the potential increase, substantial yeah. increase to rates, it means then that your your income, your turnover would need to be increased. Um, I take it for yourselves. You've already said that you supply to five bars, um, that that wouldn't be such an issue to, to deal with that. But I'm just wondering how many, just thinking across the local brewery, you know, um, sector, um, how much that's going to cause a part. Because you say seasonality has a, has a, a game to, or a part to play in this game. Yeah, I think we'd, we'd, we'd like to have that challenge, Kelly, you know, um, it's like any business, you've got to work out if you're viable, you know, we, we, I think the most important thing for us is to get ourselves to be in a position where we are a sustainable business. We want to be in Port Rush for the next hundred years. We want to create something, a rock that people know exists and want to come to Port Rush to, to come and try and taste our, our products. We want to employ lots of people in the local area. That's really important. And to be a sustainable business, we don't have to be massive. We never want to be a, a macro supplier, but we got to get to a certain size and we know what that size is. And the only way that we as a business can guarantee that we can get to that size is to be able to sell the product ourselves, to have our own destiny in our own hands with the producer's license. That's the most important thing. And there will be other breweries that, that won't be able to afford a tap room because maybe their product just isn't as good. Maybe the location that they're in isn't as viable to be able to attract people to that area. There's gonna be loads of factors, but we know where we are uh, on the tourist track that, that we, could, we could be sustainable long-term and ultimately that's what we wanna be. Can I just check with you as well, just my last question, Chair. Uh, do you guys sell outside of Northern Ireland? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I just check with you then? Um, any issues currently with that supply chain getting that produce sold outside Northern Ireland? Um, the reason why I'm asking that is because we know after 9 11, for instance, the ability to sell liquids back and forth to America became a little bit more difficult. I'm just thinking about the supply chain issues that we're currently seeing. Now, I'm hoping that they will settle down very quickly. But um, if you're not allowed to sell your own produce here, um, you know, from your tap, from a tap room, um, or if you have to depend on other bars, that market selling outside of Northern Ireland would be. Uh, what sort of percentage of the business is that? Um, we about twenty five percent. It's it's extremely worrying at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's so worrying. it is a tough time coming up for yourselves. Um, really, for sustainability, you do need to be able to sell. Yeah. Okay. No, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. That was that was quite enlightening. Good to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I then finally have Alex. Okay. 
Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, excuse my ignorance. Um, I've learnt new stuff today. I thought a tap room was a bar, so I've learnt something new. So thank you for that. Um, and just to say I'm not unsympathetic to what, what you're saying. Um, so just uh, to help me with my education on this, um, are, are tap rooms operating in, in England, Scotland and Wales? Is, is there, are they like to operate the way you would like them to operate here, if, if you could? Yeah. Well, the, the other, certainly, I don't know about... I don't know if there's probably particular nuances in Scotland and Wales to, to England, but I've certainly been to several in England and uh, they, they work really well. And it's definitely part of the tourist trail, you know. Um, uh, there's, there's an area in London where you can go from tap room to tap room and, and try different breweries, beers. It's, it's a very popular pastime. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very different. I was trying to paint a picture, um, Alex, but it's very different to a bar, you're in the brewery, the fermentation vessels are there, um, the production process is there, um, and, and you know, it, it's, it's quite spartan, it's quite sparse, uh, furniture-wise, etc. cetera. Um, so th that's, that's really what I was trying to, to give a picture of the experience of what they are. I hope that helped. Yeah, no, thank you. Um... So if, if you were allowed to operate here the way you would like, do you envisage tap rooms springing up everywhere or do you think it would just be a small... Um, I think a number of the microbreweries will avail of the opportunity. I think a number of us won't. Um, uh, as for springing up, um, no. I, it, 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 it's as I was trying to explain a bit earlier. It, a, a tap room would, wouldn't be a back door to, to open a premises where you can serve alcohol. It's just it, it's not it's not a viable business thing to do. Um, you've got you've got to attain a certain level of skill as well um, to make um, a very good craft beer. Um, it just doesn't happen. Um, it, if I can explain really what craft brewers are like, we're, we're actually um, extremely passionate, extremely creative. Um, yes, a little bit nerdy. Um, and if someone opened, it did, so it did um, go forward with that, um, tap room would fail business-wise very quickly. Um, the marketplace would find you out. Okay. So would you be happy if, if, if if you were allowed to operate, and are, are you saying to me that you would definitely be happy that you were time limited, like two to nine, as you were saying, that there was no entertainment license, and um, with all those restrictions, you, you, you would be content? Um, I was saying two to nine, and I was saying we could be have the uh, uh, option to go to 11 if we wished, um, but um, it's, it's not a pub. It's not what we want. Yeah. Okay. I'm not unsympathetic to you, so thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Andy, you want to sure, come back? Yeah. Just one quick supplementary. Um, in, in respect of, in response to uh, codes of practice, you mentioned about it, it being industry-led. Do, do you currently have any type of code of practice in respect, thinking more towards likes of the, the stronger beers? Is there any sort of uh, theme across the microbreweries as to how that should be operated? How what should be operated? Uh, in terms of a code of practice within the microbreweries at the moment, in terms of a harmonisation across the different microbreweries and how they operate, or is it very much at the discretion of each microbrewery? Do you just have any type of code in the mo at the moment where there's an understanding of operating under the same type of code? I don't think there's a, there's a, I don't think there's a joint code. Um, maybe, Laura, you know of one, but it's more just the way that the products are served is very similar in every tap room. Again, you know, if you're looking at a higher ABV beer, it's very expensive or gets more expensive, so they're actually served in, in smaller vessels because it makes more sense to drink them in smaller vessels. And also, the craft beer drinker wants to try lots of different beers, not just sit and have one all night. 
And, and, and so suppose if, if tap rooms were to be permitted under the legislation, would that be something that you would be in, uh, open to uh, in respect of a, a wider industry code, in respect of how the tap rooms would operate across the board? Yeah, I think it would be responsible, maybe just the, the, the number of units within a, within a vessel in each serving might be a good way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy. Um, I suppose just want to say I, I have very fond memories of, I think it was maybe 2017, um, going to the Beer and Cider Festival in Belfast, and while I was there being asked to be a, a judge for the, the cider competition. And I, I mean, it's absolutely right. People are there drinking in very small glasses because some of the beers are rather strong. Um, it, it, it's all done in a very organized, very dignified manner. Um, though in saying that after testing 10 ciders, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it got a bit a bit hurry for myself. Um, but it, it's something that I noticed that it wasn't that these people were going out to get you know wasted. They were going out to do a tasting because they wanted to taste the flavours and taste the beers. So I absolutely get where you're coming from on that level. Look, can I say a very big thank you to Laurie and Earl and Roger. Roger, I'm so sorry we couldn't hear you. Your, your dulcet tones, but um, as I have said to you, Roger, if you do have anything further you want to add to any of the, the answers that were given in today's session, please do send it through to us via email, and that will be distributed then forward to all members. So thank you very much for your briefing with thank us you. today. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Okay. Members, we're going to um, just take a very short comfort break um, before we resume our next uh, briefing. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item number eight, which is the Society of Independent Brewers Association, briefing us again on the licensing reg registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, you'll find this agenda at page 59 of your meeting pack. Can I then welcome to the meeting Barry Watts, who's Head of Policy and Public Affairs, and Bruce Gray, from Left Handed Giant Brewing Company. Absolutely love that name. Um, Barry, are we going to head over to you first um, to begin your brief? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning to the members of the committee. Uh, Bruce and I just want to give a few introductory remarks before we move on to uh, your questions. I very much look forward to, to briefing you and talking to you about this really fundamentally important issue. Uh, just a back background so my name is Barry Watts. I'm the head of uh, policy and public affairs at the Society of Independent Brewers. Uh, CEBA represents about 750 small independent breweries across the whole of the UK, including five currently in Northern Ireland. But we work very closely with the whole of the industry, including those that are not yet members. Now, we think that this bill represents a moment in time to future-proof the legislation in Northern Ireland and open up the potential of small breweries by allowing them to have tap rooms. Our written evidence that hopefully you've had a chance to have a look at over uh, shows you that, that positive case for tap rooms, which are an increasingly important part of small breweries' business. And they provide four key areas, a vital source of income, employment, tourism, and regeneration. And before we move on to your questions, I just wanted to kind of briefly touch on some of the, uh, the comments that have been made by others uh, to this committee and some of those perceptions they may have formed uh, through those sessions. I think providing small breweries with the ability to open tap rooms would not undermine the current marketplace, but actually support communities and encourage people to seek out craft beer in their local pubs. Craft beer is very varied. Our, med, med, our members use uh, traditional methods to vastly increase the variety of beer that's available now. They rediscovered lost or forgotten styles of beer, and they often use experimental ingredients to create things such as saisons, sours, pails, IPAs, porters, and stouts. But many of these craft beers are not high in alcohol. Uh, our member surveys have consistently shown over a number of years that the average ABV, average alcohol, is about 4.2%, which is actually lower than many mainstream lagers that you can buy in pubs. And our members have actually led the way in the development of low and no alcohol range, which is now on offer across the whole of the UK. And importantly, craft beer is often served in, in smaller measures as well. Tap rooms aren't a threat to pubs. Uh, small breweries are not looking to replace pubs or shut existing venues or force people out of a job, but the tap room offers greater choice, allows small breweries to grow their businesses and actually supports local pubs. I think tap rooms are, are very different to these pubs, bars and restaurants in that they provide an experience and a, and a community space. They fulfill those same important regulatory requirements as other places where alcohol is served 
and they act as a safe and supervised venue for the consumption of alcohol. I just want to say to me that you know, I, at the moment, I find it a lot easier for me to buy a Northern Irish craft beer in London, where I live, than I do when I last visited Belfast. I think including tap rooms as part of this bill is therefore essential to the future of Northern Ireland's breweries. And I hope the committee will support an amendment to the bill to give small breweries in Northern Ireland the chance they need to succeed. Okay, thank you, Barry. Bruce, have you anything you want to add to that at this stage? Uh, yeah, um, uh, I, I hope you don't mind my winter attire here. I'm in a, in a very cold warehouse. <laughs> so, I, know, I was going to say, I saw that and I was going to think, and my goodness, that poor guy is heating must be broken, but you're in the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hope you don't mind uh, the, the lack of shirt and tie. Um, uh, they, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Bruce, Bruce Gray. Um, uh, I'm the managing director of Left Handed Giant. Um, uh, we are um, we are a tap room led brewery based in Bristol, um, uh, and um, uh, I guess that so f- first of all we operate a tap room along with a brewery and a warehouse in Bristol, which is where m- most of what we do started. But we also operate a brew pub um, and, a, and a craft beer specific bar in the centre of Bristol. So we operate across three different premises in in the city, um, and we have done since two thousand and thirteen. Um, and obviously this, this conversation is about Northern Ireland, but all I can really do is tell you what we do and why we do it um, and hope obviously that resonates and gives you some of indication as to what these things are beneficial in your area. Um, so we, we, we're a small brewery, um, we operate under 5,000 hectolitres, which is, um, which is the, the duty barrier, so the definition of a small brewery under 5,000 hectolitres. Uh, currently, certainly, that, that's looking like change and, and adding additional um, pressure onto small breweries. Um, but yeah, we, we're, we're a small brewery. And uh, I think fundamentally, at the, the base of it, what the, 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 the reason that we started off with, uh, with a tap room and, and that I thought it was so important, and you see, you see this echoed up and down the length of the UK as well. So this, isn't, this is not just unique to us. But um, the, the reason that we started with a tap room is because starting a small brewery is, is contrary to how it may appear from the outside, is a very, very difficult and not very fun job. Um, the, the margins that are available to small breweries and the scale, the level of investment and the, and, the, and the scale that you can start at, unless obviously you're backed by a big business, um, it's extremely difficult to squeeze margin out of a brewery which is only selling it to wholesale and direct to trade i.e. not selling it straight to our consumers at all. Extremely difficult to squeeze any margin. Um, and, and because of that, one of the only places that a brewery is able to squeeze um, significant margin is via direct consumer trade within a tap room, um, inviting people down to their brewery and selling um, uh, glasses of beer and cans of beer to them to take away. Um, I would say to you, if you look at the length of the UK, um, almost without fail, the breweries that have managed to, to um, establish themselves, to grow and find stability are the ones that have done so via tap room in the first place. Um, that applies to us. And as I say, that there's 2,000 odd breweries in the UK. Um, more than half of them had opened in the last five or 10 years. Um, probably higher than that, I think. I, I've, I've not got the, the, certainly the, the, the volume of opened in the last five or 10 years is huge. Um, and, the, and the ones that have been, been able to find stability are the ones that have started off via accessing the additional margin that they can via a tap room. Um, I would say to you that it is almost crucial that small breweries have the ability to sell beer straight to consumers. Um, but that, that's obviously the, you know, the, the directly bottom line commercial side of it. Um, and there's, there's, there's far more to it than that. And I think that there's a lot of the questions that were thrown to the group before us that um, we'll probably get to cover again in the Q&A as we go on. But the, the, there is far more to it than that because small breweries are, do not have the marketing budget of big breweries. I mean, that is, that is, that is just a, a fundamental of it. The big breweries, the reason that, that most people drink um, lager is not because it tastes good. It's because the marketing for it is excellent. So when you walk into a pub, you see a brand that you recognize. You walk into a pub and even if one of us as a small brewery manages to wedge yourself in among all those tied taps, which is incredibly difficult in the first place. Even if we do that, we're an unknown brand and the pubs that are out there, um, best will in the world, the team that work behind the bar are not 
educated, are not passionate, are not excited about the products that we are selling. So when someone walks up to the bar and says that they want a beer, the people behind the bar have no motivation or interest in pushing our product upon people, explaining what it is, why it's different, that it's local, the ingredients, why it's usually a little bit more expensive, why it tastes a little bit different to what they would um, they'd be drinking normally. Um, the only place that we can really bridge that to gap and educate our customers, get them bought into who we are, what we are, why we're different, gain their loyalty is across our own bars. Um, and that is one of the, you know, the, the, the margin side of things, like the additional profit um, is important, but just as important is a small brewer's ability to meet their customers and form a connection. Um, but once that connection is formed, educate the customers as to why the product is different. So when they do go into the cities and they do see our beers on that lineup of all those different taps, they ignore the carling or the tenants or whatever is poured in your local area, and they go for that small independent breweries beer, which is sitting right in the centre there, um, which usually costs a little more, but they're happy to pay that because they know where the brewery is, they know it's a local brewery, they know it's from a, from a it, it's people that are in the local area, they know when they put the money into that beer and that brewery, that money is going full circle back into the local economy rather than most circumstances um, disappearing off into um, usually a tax haven somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, that's the, that's the more, um, uh, the more um, marketing side of it. Um, uh, but, the, you know, the, at the back end of that, the, the, I, I listened to the, the presentation by Hostality Ulster, um, I think it was last week before I came on here. Um, and honestly, the, the, the competition side of things, I find that to be a, to be a, a weirdly defeatist um, uh, attitude to take. My, my experience, so what, what I didn't say at the start, I introduced myself, my, my, my previous job was as the operations director of the Brew Dog Bars, where I, where I obtained and opened bars the, almost in every major city um, on mainland UK. So I, I have experience in, in opening up craft beer bars in, the, in, in areas that are potentially declining and in, in bars that have been closed um, in city centres that are not craft beer-led places. Um, and and my, my experience, the length and breadth of the country is that, that a, a, a rising tide lifts all ships. You know, you, you, have, you have small businesses, small breweries that, that come in, open tap rooms, they add to the, to the diverse ecosystem that can exist within a city's nightlife. And that, that excites people, it educates people, um, it impassions customers to want to go out and experience the things that are going on. If you have a nightlife that is stale, that is selling the same product, that is selling the same experience pub to pub to pub, people get fatigued and stop going out. And that is why pubs shut. You know, the, 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 the pubs that are shutting, the pubs that are endangered. And this goes to Lenten, you know, I'm, I'm not talking necessarily specifically about Northern Ireland or Belfast, this is the, the, the length of the UK. The pubs that are shutting are doing so, not because there's not enough customers, there's more people in cities now than there ever have been. They're shutting to be a lack of interest. The, the, the brands, the businesses, the people that are generating interest, the city centres that are thriving, are the ones that have embraced their local produce and allowed them to find a platform. Now, the, the bars that existed before benefit from that too, because there's more people, there's more footfall, there's more interest. Um, and I think that's a really, really important thing to understand when you're looking at the potential of additional licenses. Um, it's not, uh, in my experience, I say this is not just in Bristol, this goes the length of the UK, in my experience, that um, uh, given the opportunity um, uh, that the, 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 the addition of tap rooms, the addition of um, uh, great, passionate, independent producers can benefit everyone, um, not just the people that are operating the breweries themselves. Okay, Bruce, thank you for that. And it was actually, it was, it was good actually to get um, that experience of how things are working over in other parts of the United Kingdom. And it's good to hear that. Um, and thank you, Barry, as well. 
I suppose, Barry, I'd probably come to you and just ask you the question. In your submission, you'd stated that um, you wanted the opportunity for a level playing field in allowing small producers to open the tap rooms. Can I just ask, if it's not legislated for in this bill, what do you believe would be the impact on small producers? So, tap rooms are a fundamental, a vital source of income, regeneration, employment. And you know, I think that this issue isn't going away. This is a fantastic opportunity for Northern Ireland to, to look to update and future-proof its legislation to provide those opportunities. I think if, if you don't take uh, this route now, I think you're gonna, you, you, it's not going to go away. Brewers need it to, to survive for the future. But where we've seen um, you know, in, in the Republic of Ireland where they've introduced um, just this very limited sample and, and a, and a and a tour uh, premises license, then very few in total, only two, one brewery and one brewery distillery have actually taken up this offer so far. Um, and it just shows you how vital it is you know, that they have this opportunity to open tap room. You, you, you obviously were listening to part of our last evidence session because uh, you would have been on the on the uh, waiting to come in to speak to us um, and you heard various things that they had said. Um, on, I know um, the issue to do with um, the restrictions, opening hours, um, size of, of measures. Um, any comment that you want to make on those? Absolutely. I, I think um, when, when considering this, uh, you know, it's really important that you uh, look to what's appropriate for the local business, but also the local community. And that's, that's what exists in the, in the licensing rules, laws uh, in, in England, Wales and, and Scotland, that there's a consideration of what's appropriate locally for the business to allow them to have those opportunities to innovate, to grow, but also to the local community. I mean, you know, the 2003 uh, licensing act that, that Bruce uh, worked under and uh, exists in England and Wales, it, you know, has four key aims, which is to prevent crime and disorder, public safety, public nuisance, and protection of children. So it's there to protect public residents, but it also recognises the important role that licensed uh, premises can have to the local community by encouraging innovation and supporting responsible premises. And I think that's, that's what's important, it's getting that right balance. And you know, you've made it clear that this is what this amendment's all about, is getting the right balance for Northern Ireland. And I think tap rooms can be part of that. Yeah, could, I, could I jump in on that as well? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, so the, within our tap room, the, I think it's important to to recognise certainly the, the way in which we operate here is that we we need to apply to our local licensing authority the same way as we would if we were to apply for a bar license. I mean, it is a bar license. We operate under exactly the same types of um, legislation and law as as we do in our bar in the city centre and actually find, you know the when, when it comes to opening hours when it comes to um, the types of alcohol we serve the measures we serve that's a, that's always a conversation with a local licensing licensing officer um, as you're applying for that license so for instance in our in our brew pub um, in the city centre, there was a great deal of concern over the over the ABVs of craft beer, and we've got an agreement with with that license particularly that we don't serve anything above six percent in a measure above a half pint. Um, so you know, within within each license, there there is the ability, and this you know this would be the same, I'm sure, with with the tap rooms in, in Northern Ireland. Within each license, there is the ability to put um, a parameters in which are appropriate to the area it's in. So for instance, you've got a tap room which is, in a, which is within a residential area, um, give it an earlier closing time. Um, I license this within an industrial area where there's no residents within um, a, I, a set specific um, distance given a later um, opening time. And um, uh, you know, look at the ABVs. People are set if there's concern about the about the ABVs. Um, there's an easy ability to put restrictions in that. Um, so, but but that's always you know, it's a conversation with a local licensing officer who knows the local community, who knows the local area, and is able to make um, sound judgments um, based upon the various different influences that go into it. Okay, thank you for that. 
Um, uh, members, can you please signal if you want to come in? I know Kelly, um, albeit we can't see her signal, but we did get your message. So, Kelly, can I bring you in first? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, folks. Um, you're raising, you're actually giving us quite a lot of answers here to other questions that we have. Um, I'm very interested just that you were talking there um, about that each licence can define the strength of products sold and the, the operating hours. Um, can I just check then where that happens? Um, who manages that license? Is it the local council or? Yeah. So do you, do you so in the in the in England and Wales? Scotland's got this slightly different terminology, but same same principle. We have um, licensing officers. Do, do you guys have? Yeah. Um, so it's the, it's the same people. So you know. So we we um, as a tap room operate under exactly the same um, uh, the same laws as a bar. So the people that are that are currently managing the bar licences would be the people that would then, I assume, begin to manage the taproom licences. It would be those same people that when you, when you apply for a licence for a taproom, um, you would, so we, you know, again, I can only speak my own experiences here. Um, so, you know, we put a licence application in which details the parameters under which we would like to operate that premises. And then normally there's some negotiation around about that where the licensing officer comes back and says, well, actually, I think that's too late. And, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a compromise made. The licensing officer says, well, actually, you know, in the, in the instance of the Fensel's Reach Brew Pub, it was, well, actually, you know, you're, you're right in the city centre, you're right on the edge of a, of a, a park that's quite quiet at night time. Um, and I'm concerned about the strength of ABV. I, in my opinion, unjustly concerned, um, but um, it's still concerned. And we came to a compromise. You know, as I said, it was a case of saying, well, actually, anything that's over 6% will not serve um, in anything above a half pint, which actually, and, and I think this would be echoed across all the breweries that, that you've been speaking to, was absolutely fine by us because we would never serve a beer over 6% above a half pint anyway. Um, uh, you know, part of um, part of our principles is about serving um, alcohol and measures that are appropriate to um, its strength, um, and that goes for wine and spirits as well as beer. But so we were perfectly happy to sign up to that stipulation. But yeah, it's the, sorry, I'm, I'm um, going on about there. The, the, no, no, no. The, this is very the, useful because I was just going to ask you there. Um, so, so you you guys went to negotiation. Is there open? Um, consultation with other bar owners or tap room owners in the area? Yeah, um, there, is the ability, there is the ability, so that there's a 30 day consultation period when you apply for a license, and everyone that's, um, that's local um, residents, local business owners, um, uh, all different facets of the council, so fire department, planning, um, uh, police. And everyone gets to put their opinion forward. If there is no objections to the licence, um, then it will generally speak and be passed without going to a board. But if there's even one objection to that licence, that could be that could be a resident that lives um, down around the corner saying, um, for no reason, you know, I just don't want it. Um, it would go to a, it would go to a panel. Um, and everyone has to arrive and, um, and have a discussion. Um, and that panel consists of all the different facets of the council and the licensing authority. Um, and there's a discussion made during that, along with the people that are making the license application and all of those people. And at the end of that, there's a decision made. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a rigorous process um, that, that's, that's undertaken to get to the point where you are, you are granted a license. Um, and there'd be no ability for, um, for, for, for you to end up with a licence that, um, that was not appropriate to the local area. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's the same process then for anybody who wants to open up a pub or a bar. Um, yeah. just, just on that then, what's the cost comparison to someone wanting to have their tap room going through this consultation process to a bar setting up? A, um, a, a license application, the, the, the yeah. cost is the same. The setup of the two things is, is vastly different. Yeah. Um, the, the cost of setting a brewery up with a tap room at the front yeah. is vastly more expensive than setting up a, a bar itself. But actually, I think, was it you that asked the question earlier on about the uh, reference in the back door to opening a pub in the city centre? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I noted that down when I was listening to it, um, and, I'm, and I'm glad it came back up actually because the the the, the reality is with uh, with uh, 
pub uh, or, or a brewery and a tap room. Again, there, there are already um, legislation in place to manage the usage of those different things. So, so a pub has, has, a, has a planning consent to be a pub and a, and a brewery has a planning consent to be a brewery. A tap room is an ancillary use to the brewery. So, you know, the, for instance, we are, in a, we are in a warehouse right now. We've got a tap room downstairs. Um, we couldn't turn this into a pub, for instance, because the planning wasn't appropriate for that. So when we put the planning, sorry, when we put the license application in, for a tap room, we had to display that the tap room was ancillary use to the brewery. Yeah. Does that make sense? And obviously, yeah. if you were if you were if you were looking to open a pub, you would have to display that the premises had the correct planning and that the the main usage was as a pub. Yeah. To for a back door to open a, a brewery in order to open a tap room, which essentially was just a pub and a city centre, the, the planning department would would catch you at the at the very outset of that conversation, um, like it would be the the the, 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 the you know try, trying to open a, a a brewery with a tap room in the city city centre. There'd be there'd be far far greater hurdles to overcome than than, than just the license application. So I don't yeah. I don't believe that they, they by changing your legislation to allow a brewery to apply for a license to have a tap room, you would be in any danger of opening a back door to have people sneaking um, a, you know, claim, claiming one usage um, in order to get another usage. Yeah. Which is one of the things that uh, had been raised with me concerns, so I'm, I'm delighted you've answered that. Um, one of the other things that I had mentioned earlier, and I'll ask you about it as well, and it's my last question, um, Chair. Um, in the current proposals in our legislation where it talks about, um, it, it, it currently says that you're not authorised um, to sell intoxicating liquor unless it's produced in the production premises. And it's, as was spoken about earlier, that collaboration of products, um, is that a big thing within the within the, the, the local brewery market? Um, and um, is it something we need to take into consideration? I, I, absolutely. Um, I... And um, also the, the possibility of breweries, because we, we, we for instance, started off as a, as a, as a, it was terms of gypsy brewery. So we, so we had no brew care ourselves and brewed our, our beer elsewhere. Had a, had a where, you know, we've got a storage facility where we store our beer and sell it from and had a tap room there. So, and obviously there are breweries that will, that will either not have their own brew kit or um, they will they will increase their production by using other people's facilities. Um, so they'll brew some beer in other people's facilities along with the beer they brew in their own facility. Um, but again, I think there's a you know with with that point, and I don't think there would be. And this is just my and, and you know and, and I appreciate this is just my opinion. I don't think there'd be any need for for you guys at this stage to write in stipulations like that into the legislation because the local licensing officers will always have the ability to put those restrictions in themselves so they can look at a brewery um, and their license application and say who are you and what are you um, why do you want to serve beer that's made elsewhere answer being we do a lot of collaborations um, uh, that can be written into the license answer being that we brew our beer at other people's facilities that can be written into the license um, you know, there's the, the, I, I think that the certainly within within mainland um, UK, the the legislation just allows a brewery to have the right to apply for a license. So it doesn't it doesn't give us a right to have a license. It just gives us the yeah. right to put, apply for a license. And then it's our job at that point to go and persuade the local licensing officers as to what kind of license we should have and how much freedom we should have within that license. I think that's a re probably a really important point to, um, to, to get at this point as well. There's no, there's, certainly for, for us, there's no, we don't have a right to have a license in any way, shape or form. Um, uh, you know, we, all we have is a right to apply for a license. Okay. Uh, collaborative beers are, are a growing phenomenon in the industry now, so more and more, they, they, they work together on the, on the uh, recipe, they'll go to one of the breweries uh, and brew it, and then they'll jointly badge it up to have their own logos and jointly sell the beer. And I think it's important that, that recognise that, that it's a growing issue, a uh, growing thing, and you know, we shouldn't be stopped from actually being able to sell those products, even though that they, they haven't actually been you know, exactly produced in that brewery at the time.
Yeah. The, the other thing I just wanted to ask you was, so, um, you know, if, if somebody setting up a tap room, um, obviously if they have premises like yourself, Bruce, there, um, you know, you have, you have somewhere where people can see the process, they can take part in that. But I'm thinking about those, those licensing officers then, do they have a list of all of, because the difficulty that we have is there isn't a list of all of the licenses across Northern Ireland or where they're all based. Um, you'd have, to, as we've been told, you have to go around the district courts to find that out. In your experience of elsewhere within the UK, is there a list of all the licenses that's readily available for that that licensing officer or the licensing panel um, so that they can refer to that? Yeah, there's a, there's a central office in each area. Um, so no, there's not a central office, or there's not a central point for those licenses within the country. Um, so Bristol, for instance, has a licensing office. Um, and if I was to want to access the licenses in Bristol, I would have to go there. And they say we go for Leeds in Manchester and any other area, which sounds like similar to what you guys have got. So well, the only thing is the licenses that are issued from a district court would be held in that district court. But if you're an enforcement officer and you wanted to look at the detail, or if there's variation in the licences, that's what I think, that there, there may need to be a listing kept somewhere separate yeah. because a court, you know, it's issuing the licence, but um, it's not necessarily the enforcement body over that licence. Right. Yeah. Okay. Certainly the licences are, are publicly accessible. Yep. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know if that's where you whether that's that, that's the same there or not, but you know, and, uh, it's certainly beneficial to um, uh, to everyone I think to have you know to have access to those things in the central point. Openness and transparency is always the way. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Um, that has been really really helpful. Really yeah. appreciate it. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you, Kelly. Any other member want to ask anything? I don't see any other hands up on our remote people. So, no, oh, we do. Mark has now put his hand up. Mark. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Bruce and Barry uh, for that presentation. It was really, really interesting. I mean, there's clearly a lot of enthusiasm and an awful lot of expertise there. It was just uh, looking, I was particularly, well, I found the kind of circular economy argument that Bruce put forward. <laughs> Very, very uh, effective and impactful. I think that's something that really does uh, need considered, and that's it about keeping money <laughs> here, uh, hard-earned cash. Here, there's not a lot of it, but it's important that we do retain that spend or, or that profit in, in, in the north here. Uh, now, the other point by me, or Bruce made, sorry, and it was very good again, and it was talking about the diversity of offer in city centre and the rise in tide lifting all boats. And I think that itself is very compelling and convincing. However, when we look, that, that was in relation to the, the bars end of things that, that, and his experience opening them. Yet here we have brewers who are trying to allay the concerns that some people have by saying that they won't be in the city centre and that, that they are industrial in nature and will be in industrial estates outside of the city centre. I was just wondering, uh, is there any way of kind of square in that circle, Bruce? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, to, to, give you, to give you the experience in Bristol, um, uh, which, which again is, is, is echoed um, uh, throughout mainland UK, certainly, um, uh, when when we opened two thousand and thirteen, there were there were two breweries in the city, um, and we took on our bar, small bar at that point, um, uh, with a with a chunk of rent free, very cheap rent. It was empty premises throughout the city, um, uh, and um, uh, the the rise of uh, independent breweries um, uh, for a start. But there, there are you know there's distilleries that come off the back of that. There's just there's just local produce. Um, uh, has exploded throughout yeah. Bristol, and now you look at it, and there are there are over twenty breweries, um, most of whom have tap rooms. Um, uh, there is not an empty bar in the city centre. I would, if I would, in fact, I, we we are we are looking. We have been looking for some time. Covid um, uh, aside, to take on more premises, can't find them. Um, uh, the the city is vibrant. Um, and to, to square that circle, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the reason for that is because people in Bristol have embraced the local scene. And then by extension, the, the bars that were set empty are opened by people 
that are excited by the local scene, they showcase it, they're passionate about it, they're excited about it. The other bars round about them begin to also showcase in among their normal offering things from the local scene. And you end up with, with more footfall, you end up with more people, you end up with more money being spent, not just in the city centre, in the tap rooms round about the city centre. Um, it just increases the, the, the tide of people that are consuming and that are spending. It also increases hugely to the, you know, Br Bristol has turned in to a destination venue for, um, uh, for craft beer, for local produce. Um, people travel to the city in normal times um, uh, every weekend um, to come and experience the, the produce as fresh as it possibly can be that the city has to offer. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the bars, the breweries that have opened up, um, uh, the 20 odd breweries, there is, there is less than a handful of us. There's less than five, I'm trying to, there be three that I can think of off my head. They've got bars in the city centre. Um, they all they all have tap rooms in the industrial states that circle the city centre. Uh -huh. um, you know they're they're not they're not overtaking the city centre with their own premises. Um, all they have done is create a a, a point of focus um, and a point of excitement, a point of passion for for the people that are consuming in the city. We have one street, the street that, that my bar is on actually. Um, that when we took that bar on was, was almost empty. There was, there was two other pubs that were open at that point. And it has turned into one of the best beer streets in the, in the UK. Um, people travel from, from all over the UK to go and visit King Street. Um, uh, you know, it's turned into, and that, you know, that's, that's not breweries, that is, that is, that is entrepreneurs um, uh, from the local area who have recognised the excitement round about uh, a thing um, and they've jumped on board with it. Um, and again, I'm not, you know, that street, King Street, if we were down there now, if, if the other places hadn't opened up, um, I think we'd have a good bar down there. You know, it'd be, it would be busy. But the fact is that we are surrounded now by other people that share our passion. Um, and, um, and the street has got busier and busier and busier and the gravity to it, gravity to it has increased and increased um, to the point now where it is absolutely packed. You know, more, more um, uh, assumed competition has led to more business. No, so sounds sounds great. <laughs> like the chair did in a previous meeting, I lament the fact that we can't do more site visits or any site visits at this present juncture. <laughs> now, uh, and uh, as regards to uh, and other points that have been raised there, and it was around the responsible drinking element and and the APVs. I think it's fair enough to surmise that the last thing that any brewer wants is. A piss up on the brewery. <laughs> Did they borrow a, a phrase basically? Because you're in an industrial setting, uh, you know, some some companies aren't going to find it, or well, they're going to find it difficult anyway. I I think and some won't find it viable. We spoke there in an earlier session about an increase in the cost of rates that a business would have to pay if they had the tap room and insurance. What are the insurance implications for opening a tap room in an industrial site? There are there are additional costs. Certainly, you know, it's on it's on our um, insurance policy, and it increases the cost of it. Um, but um, as a, you know, one of my opening comments was about the the increase in margin. You know, there's a, in any business there is a there is a balancing act of um, potential for additional income and margin versus. Um, a, um, increased costs to access that additional revenue and margin, um, and, every, and there's a thing. Look, you know the 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 breweries they potentially have the access to opening up a tap room. Some will choose not to. You know the you know, the location or the or the type of product they've got, um, or the type of people they are, um, it may not be appropriate to um, to that type of offering. But many, many will look at it and see it as being a, a balance that, um, that most definitely is worth the, the, the additional costs. Yeah, but, but I mean, it's hard to envisage and having spoken to and heard from a number of, of uh, businesses or individuals working in the sector. Now, I don't think a responsible drinking or promotion of that is going to be an issue. No. Uh, I mean, the last thing, whenever margins are tight enough as it is, you, you don't want a scenario where you're, you're having to employ the worst staff or security personnel and things like that. It, it is a pretty controlled environment 
Yeah, in, in Bristol, um, the, the, the centre of Bristol, as, as, the, as most city centres, has had a very um, big problem with, uh, with problem drinking over the course of the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, uh, people are, are fleeing um, the, the harbour side, which is Bristol city centre, you know, stag do, hen do, heavy drinking, pints, shots, fleeing that area to come and drink in King Street, to come and drink in the tap rooms, Right, and on the outskirts of Bristol, to get away from the drunkenness and the excess that comes along, I find it honestly, the, the, I find it really um, uh, frustrating on one hand and bemusing on the other that people have an assumption that craft beer is is a problem because of the higher ABVs of some of the products. The the problem is people going to pubs. In my opinion, again, the, the problem I think is people going to pubs, drinking pints of lager that tastes of nothing, slinging ten pints down the throat for two pound fifty or three pound a pint, and then moving on to spirits and shot pots. Yeah, and people are drinking for the sake of the alcoholic impact, not for the experience, the taste, and the flavour. Whereas when people move across to craft beer or discover craft beer, they begin to, to, to leave behind the perception that you're drinking alcohol, drinking beer for the sake of the alcoholic impact. You're drinking it for the sake of the experience and the flavor um, and um, the, the, um, the, you know, the, 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 well, the experience and the flavor, you know, that, that, that's, the, that's the fundamentals of it. Um, it is, a, it is a, a step forward in the consumption of alcohol, not a step backwards. Brilliant. No, thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Brian. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, no other members have indicated that they want to speak at this time. Barry and Bruce, can I say a big thank you um, to, to both of you for briefing the committee today. We did get then a slightly different perspective, um, which is good. And um, yeah, so thank you. Learned, learned quite a lot today from our briefing. So thanks again. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, members, we're going to move on then directly to agenda item number nine, which is a uh, briefing from camera on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, you'll find the agenda item at page 69 of your meeting pack. Can I then welcome Tom Strainer to the meeting today? And Tom, can I ask you then to begin your briefing? Uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you for um, giving us the time. Um, as, as you said, we're a consumer organisation, and, and funny enough, Camera came about 50 years ago now, um, after our four founders took a, a holiday to the Republic of Ireland, and uh, were sort of horrified by the state of the market there in the lack of choice for people who wanted good beer. And, and that inspired them to, to come back to the UK and to set up uh, the campaign for Real Ale. And, and that's something which has run through Camera's campaigning since then. It's about making sure that people who like beer have a good choice, they have variety, they have diversity, they have value and they have quality in what they're drinking. And they're not forced to drink two or three brands because that's the, the companies that have a stronger hold in the market. You know, and we think that consumers in Northern Ireland deserve that same decent choice of local, independent, specialised beers, just like everyone else across these islands. So we support this legislation. But as, as you've heard already from the evidence session, there are concerns about the way the market is operating. And we share those concerns, you know, this stranglehold that the, the very big macro operators have on, uh, on pubs. You've heard some, hopefully what would alarm you, uh, hearing some, some very emotive language, you know, saying that people are locked out of the draft trade. There's a scandal of breweries being stymied from getting their beers onto taps. And, and you know, we've heard evidence and you've heard evidence today about um, some, some interesting tactics about, you know, if an independent brand is put onto a tap, there's a threat that, okay, we're not going to supply you with the volume brands that you currently have in your pub. We don't think that the, the competition in the beer and pubs industry is a bad thing and it should be welcomed. Um, and as you've already heard, you know, brewery tap rooms operate successfully alongside pubs in Great Britain and across many parts of the world. Um, they're not competition, they coexist with pubs. They, as Bruce said, a rising tide raises all ships. Um, someone asked, you know, do cask drinkers, do craft beer drinkers, spend more and yes they do the cask report which is a, a uk report into the cask beer market showed that people who tend to choose cask beer spend about 30 percent more in pubs than, than ordinary drinkers and these are people that are repertoire drinkers as well so they're not just 
drinking cask and craft. They're, they're coming to a pub, they're choosing things that match their mood. But like vegetarians in a social group, they tend to, to set the venues that people go to. You know, beer fans want to see the brands they want to see in a pub, and they will be the ones who lead their party to those pubs. So if a pub has great independent brands on, they will get better business. And business for people who aren't going to drink beer but are accompanying the beer drinkers and will be drinking other things in that pub. You know, we feel that, you know, for many years, small independent brewers and cider makers have been at a huge disadvantage uh, compared to competitors, you know, elsewhere in the islands and Europe and further afield. Uh, Barry mentioned the fact that it's easier for him to get Northern Ireland craft beer brands in London than it is maybe for drinks in Northern Ireland. And, you know, conversely, it seems slightly strange that drinks in Northern Ireland find it easier to order beers online from outside of the nation than they can get brands that are maybe brewed down the road from them. So, you know, we think in order to let these great independent local businesses who bring so much into their communities, who bring so much into their local economies that offer employment, training, apprenticeship opportunities as well, especially to young people, they need to be able to grow their business, they need to have fair access to markets. And we think the new category producer's license, you know, needs to be fit for purpose, needs to match this and, and, and it should not be overly onerous or restricted in order to allow that growth in that responsible community way that has been discussed by many of the people already so far. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, we, you, you've also been listening in, I'm sure, this morning to the various witness sessions that we have had. Um, I want to ask you about the surrender principle. You've highlighted it in your submission to us. Um, that it needs to be examined uh, with a view to reform, albeit it is not within this draft bill. Um, so it's just to ask you, do you feel it should have been in the bill? And just to ask you then again, do you want to see the surrender principle abolished or do you want to see extra um, licences be made available? Um, we, we do understand the surrender principle is a, a tricky issue and that you know, many people in the industry will, will have the licenses and be viewing the value associated with that license as, as part of the goodwill they built up in their business and, you know, is, is, is part of the value of their business. Um, but as you've heard from other people here, it does push up the, the entry cost to new operators massively, you know, with price of licenses, you know, into the hundreds of thousands in some cases. What we're also seeing, and I think is a worry, that these licences, when they are surrendered, often are not going to another local community pub. They're going to either off-licences or supermarkets who have the, the deep pockets to acquire them. And so we're seeing a, a drop-off in rural pubs particularly, and rural pubs are incredibly important to the communities that they serve. We know pubs are a force for good. We know that they're serving communities. We know that they're giving people an opportunity to consume alcohol in a responsible way, um, plus all the other benefits you get from meeting people, talking to people, the way they combat loneliness and things like that. There's also some confusion about the way the Strange Principle doesn't necessarily apply to other types of license. So we think there's some flexibility there in the way that you could create new licenses without necessarily having to take licenses away from people who feel they've built up value in them. But we would say, you know, it's something which, as you say, maybe it's not something you are looking at at the moment, but it, it is something which needs to be addressed because it does seem to put an artificial constraint on the innovation development that you've heard about already from businesses that aren't necessarily identical to pubs. They're offering something different. They're offering a different experience. And they're offering different benefits and values to the communities that they're in. No, thanks for that. And we know we've heard um, from previous witness sessions um, when it, it, on the issue of the price of, of licences um, under the surrender principle um, that very much that would knock any small independent brewer or distiller really out of the market when it comes to paying for that because we know that our supermarkets have much deeper pockets. So they, you, you would like to see then, I assume, a, a, create a new, or you've said to create a new licence um, specifically for the likes of yourselves and the people you represent? Well, we don't represent people who actually operate pubs and breweries. We represent the consumers that use them, but our feeling would be okay. that actually if, if you're able to uh, reform the licensing system, if you're able to create different types of licenses, as we've discussed, maybe brewery tap rooms, that adds to the diversity and the choice that drinkers have. It, it adds to the, the great variety in the, in the beer market. Um, and that is beneficial to everyone, consumers and licensees alike. 
Uh, just another issue then uh, to do with the, 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 the issue of tied in with pubs. Um, is there something within this bill then that you feel that we can do um, when we look at the issue of, of um, uh, independent brewers having uh, taps within pubs and, and all of that sort of stuff? Is there something then within the bill that we could put in any specifics um, to allow that to, to happen um, under more of a, of a, a framework? Yeah, I, yeah, as we said, we think competition is good. We think that um, independent brands having access to market is good, not just for them, but for the whole market and for drinkers themselves. Um, so what we're on for is a level playing field um, and, and giving like, uh, brewers the, the ability to access that market. Now, what we're talking about here is obviously details of the tap room license and the amendments to that, but certainly we think it's important that it is looked at the competition issue in Northern Ireland. You've heard some evidence from people already. Um, and as I said, with, with some quite troubling language about the way competition operates in this market, the people are maybe being frozen out of the market. There's maybe some pretty sharp practice by macro operators to maintain their stranglehold in this market. Um, and, and it does mean, as you've heard from the people who actually are operating, that small and local brewers and cider makers can't sell their product on tap in the vast majority of local pubs. Um, but they're also restricted from selling through other avenues, through you know markets, through special events, um, online and things like that. So I think it's well worth looking at the, the competition and whether it's healthy or not, and whether actually um, you know, these great small independents are being unfairly disadvantaged. Yeah, and I think you, you've, you, a phrase that has come up time and time again has been this level playing field, and you said it there yourself. And I mean, it's not only a level playing field for... Brewers, brewers and distillers, it's a level playing field for consumers um, as well um, that needs to be addressed. Um, I'm going to just open up to members. I know I have Kelly wants to ask a few questions. Kelly? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, you're giving us a different perspective now from, from some of the others that we've spoken about. Um, as you say, there has been quite a mode of language used um, with regards to the competition. I, I was a bit, a, a bit annoyed uh, whenever I heard um, others say that they would deny access to their bar uh, for anybody who had gone to a tap room. Um, I'm just thinking from Cameron's point of view, have you ever come across this in, in anywhere else in the UK? I, I think you do come across it. And I, I think thankfully elsewhere in the UK, it's becoming less of an issue. But certainly we have heard examples of pretty sharp practices in terms of um, you either get what's called soft loans, where the big brewers with deep pockets will, will give a very cheap loan to a business, but in return for you only stock our brands. Uh, there's approaches where they may be supplied spence equipment or seller equipment, but again, that's dependent on, you know, you don't pump anything through those pumps other than the brands that we want you to. And then there's also the, the sort of the, the sort of holding people to ransom when you say, well, if you dare to support, to support a local independent brewer, um, and put their beer on the bar, we might think twice about whether we're going to supply the, the volume brands, which you know is, is a key part of a lot of pub businesses. The, the macro lagers are very popular, so pubs need to balance out. And, and this has been mentioned by several people in the evidence session. This isn't about saying all pubs should only be serving local independent brands. It's about giving that diversity of choice. So if someone walks in wanting a macro lager, they get it. If someone walks in wanting to um, experience something brewed down the road from them, they also have that choice. They're not shoehorned into that. But I think you're right that you know, this isn't unique to Northern Ireland. Um, it's something which other areas have looked at and they've, they've struggled with and, and you don't have quite the same issue here with the Thai system that we do in, in the wider UK. Um, but there, there's a kind of quasi tie in terms of the soft loans or the supply agreements that people have with the, the large producers. But I think from a consumer's point of view, to be refused access at a door um, because you may have been at a tap room um, is, is somewhat concerning. Um, the surrender principle you've spoke about with, with the chair there, Unfortunately, as we know, um, within the legislation, we could set limits on how much a license is. There already is a, a cost for a license through the courts. The official license, the surrender principle, uh, means that there's a negotiation, a private sale barter happens, and that's what's pushing the prices up here. Um, that's not something I think that... I don't think that this legislation can deal with because the current rules regarding the cost of license... Um, are quite affordable. Um, it's it's that private sale 
that happens um, because of the, the reduced numbers here. So I think when you've said about getting a, a, a license for independent brewers um, is the only way around that. And if they have to be tied to a production area, you know, their, their brewery, then that's it. I, I take it then you have no problems at whatsoever with any of the other content um, about children, the change to children being able to be on premises, the late licensing laws. Is there anything else that camera um, has had a look at within our legislation considerations and, and has concerns about or everything else? Fair enough. No, I, I think we're supportive of, of this step forward that's being taken. Um, I think our general concerns over any of the, the particular details in legislation would be adding on too many onus restrictions and front-loading the, the, the start of the process. I think as Bruce very articulated talks about, there are measures in place already to, and lots of hoops people have to, to jump through to get a license in the first place. And, and I think we need to trust those processes that are already in place rather than putting a, a lot of additional restrictions in to deal with a tiny minority of problems. When in fact the majority of operators are going to be hugely responsible, their names above the door. And unlike a pub say, when, when a tap room is ancillary to um, the brewery business, it's very much in their interest to preserve their reputation as a brewery. So they don't want to be running irresponsible tap rooms. They don't want to be seen as, as causes for problems. So I think it's about trusting operators to do the right thing and trusting in the processes that already exist to control and enforce if necessary, if people then, you know, there are complaints and problems. And as you've heard from um, people previously in, in this session, there are very few complaints and there are major places some of in the residential area, all those noise issues on a case by case basis to make sure that that license is suitable for that area rather than having blanket restrictions, which, which restrict everyone unfairly, we'd suggest. And just on that, um, I'm just thinking about that local, as Britt had, had described, you know, with the local council, the same laws really apply to the bar, but the same people who manage the bar licences are managing those taproom licences. I'm just thinking, as far as customers are concerned, um, is, is there anything there that causes concern? For instance, I'm, wor I'm worried about the 30-day consultation period where Bruce, and maybe I picked him up wrong, seemed to indicate if there's one objection then it would go to the panel you could basically have it that a local bar could object to anybody else having a license and force it to the panel um, I, I think you're right sometimes the, the the consultation period which which we agree with you need consultation on these things but it, it does sometimes lend itself to people um objecting for maybe not strictly legitimate reasons you'd hope that's picked up in the licensing process um, and, and you also get examples of people who uh, have, have bought a house next to a pub that already exists. And then when they apply for an extension for license or something, they then complain about the noise from the pub that they knew was there when they, when they moved in. So I think you're always going to have those issues. But I think broadly, the consultation periods were, I think they're important to ensure that those hoops are jumped through by these operators to make sure they're doing so responsibly and, and lessening their impact. Because, you know, operators don't want pubs to be a problem. Consumers don't want pubs to be a problem. Um, and generally, the vast majority of pubs operate incredibly successfully in their communities, thanks to the existing legislation that's there, um, and, and provide great services in a responsible way to people. Um, if, if there was changes made to the current proposals to enable tap rooms to take place, um, what do you expect? Uh, uh, sort of as a guesstimate, I suppose, the percentage, um, you know, of, of craft beers or, or crap, you know, any of those um, uh, drinks, what percentage of the market could we see and then increase to, um, you know, at the moment in Northern Ireland, I can't imagine it being a very substantial percentage of the market, but from your experience elsewhere, um, how has that enabled that local pr product to grow and what percentage do you think that it could, it could make in Northern Ireland? It's really tricky to put a figure on things, especially under, under I'm going to use the cliche, these very strange circumstances. Um, the trend we've seen has actually been a slight decline in the beer market. I think that's why it's really important to, to encourage the craft beer market, because the one thing that has revitalised interest in beer has been craft beer. It's really reignited interest in people. And, and to use that other cliche again, it's, it's the rising tide where the more interest you have in interesting beers, actually people return from wine and gin and all the other things and back to the beer market, even if they're drinking the macro brands, they're just seeing another interesting thing that they can try. So 
I, as you've heard, there's 30 or 35 um, breweries in Northern Ireland who might take advantage of this. I don't think you're going to see a huge increase in percentage. But, you know, if you just incrementally saw a few more pubs putting local brands on their bar, you're going to start seeing that reversal of a decline in beer sales to an increase in beer sales and supporting. And a really important point was made by several people already. This is money which is in the, in inside the economy. It's not being taken out and siphoned out by big companies. It's money that's being earned in the local economies, reinvested into local economies. Um, and if you can see an increase in that, however small, it's going to be beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just say, my uh, locally, I have Ecklandville Distillery, um, just not too far away from my map now. Um, and the boost to the local economy has been extraordinary. And while they're making whiskies and gins, um, it, it's remarkable. Um, but no, thank you very much for that. Um, very, very useful again. Thank you very much, Tom. Okay. Kelly, thank, thank you. Uh, Robin? Uh, can I thank Mr. Strainer for coming along to us today and um, welcome the evidence that, that he's, he's presented to us. Um, as Kelly Armstrong said, it's from a different uh, perspective. Can I just ask, uh, the emphasis uh, to allow top rooms has been that the manufacturer of the uh, beer should be allowed to sell their product products on the site. Would you envisage a change in the legislation to allow the uh, brewery to actually bring in other beers for sale in the top room? Uh, I at the moment, our, our general hope is that we can just allow producers to sell their own products in their tap rooms. And a word that's been used quite a lot already is control, uh, to, to have the control over how they sell their products in their own tap rooms. Um, I think, as Bruce said, there, there's possibilities when you have co um, collaboration brews, or maybe they join forces with another brewer to, to produce a special beer. Um, that they might want to sell that as well. And I don't think that's moving massively away from the, the intention of the legislation. And I think what we're also hearing from uh, brewers in all mind is that they're happy to sell their own produce and they don't see a massive need to sell lots of other things. As, as you've already heard, they're not looking to recreate a public experience. This is a very different experience. It's a showcase for their products. And it's in their interest to showcase their products rather than dilute that with lots of other different products. Um, with few exceptions, yeah, again, if they've been involved in a collaboration brew somewhere, um, in which case both brewers would probably make it available in their shops. But I don't think we'd be pushing for, you know, opening this up massively to allow them to sell whatever they like in their tap rooms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Robin, thank you. No other member has indicated that they want to ask any questions at this stage. So can I then just thank you, Tom? Um, for coming and briefing us today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Bye-bye. Okay, members, we're going to then move straight on to agenda item 10, which is a briefing from Unite the Union on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, you'll find this at agenda item uh, at page 86 of your meeting pack. Can I then go on and welcome Neil Moore to our meeting today? Um, Neil, do you want to go ahead and brief the committee? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, obviously, this uh, bill represents the biggest shakeup in licensing and potentially in our in our industry, um, second only to the effects of, of the pandemic over the past year. I'm obviously here as Unite the Union's hospitality coordinator, and we have an established presence in this sector now for the past two to three years. Um, and importantly, an increasing membership, um, which is um, attempting and people are joining the union um, to tackle some of the issues and long-standing and well-publicized issues um, around a lack of, of workers' rights, um, breaches of, of employment rights, and, and the bad rep that, that the sector has um, around this. So our, our, our evidence and, and our submission to this bill is, is purely on the basis of, of the concerns of, of workers. But also, I think this bill represents an opportunity to strengthen workers' rights, um, potentially with the inclusion of, of social clauses around licensing, 
but also um, addressing some of the issues that exist, uh, already exist under the current licensing regime around workers working anti-social hours, but also, um, you, you know, uh, for further kind of uh, extending extending rights as, as licenses come come up uh, for for review. So while, while we broadly support um, this bill and it is a positive in, in tackling um, some of the more uh, regressive elements of, of our licensing regime, which which are obviously a, a pain to to workers and not just employers in terms of enforcing um, some some of the what, what can appear to to people outside of, of Northern Ireland as being quite quite arbitrary um, restrictions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm purely here on on the basis of, uh, of, of 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 what we can do to, to strengthen this bill and the amendments that that unite the union and our and our membership would like to see um, put put in place. And other than that, um, and I'm sure there there's some questions in terms of our, our written submission. Um, there has been some opposition um, from our members, particularly on the grounds of health and safety, to the extension of drinking up time. Um, there's not a lot of research that has been done on this, um, so I'm sure that the committee can appreciate a lot of this is coming anecdotally um, from our members that, that, that we've, we've, we've surveyed and, and spoke to um, about this bill, um, but there was, there was actually quite some quite emotive um, opposition to that extension, pure uh, on the basis, first and foremost, of drinking up time as, 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 as other submissions to this committee over the past couple of weeks have highlighted um, of, of being quite difficult um, to, to get customers out. There's, there's high incidences, um, much, much more higher than, than during the, the normal um, hours of operation in that sort of last half an hour period um, of drinking up time, of violence, of abuse and, and harassment against staff. And I, I think there is a there's a certain logic um, behind our members' opposition to an, an extension in drinking up time could lead to an, an increase in those incidences. Um, further to that, um, we we are concerned about the expectation of workers of working um, later into the, the the night or the early hours of the morning, um, through both the the extension of of, of licensing hours on on occasion. Um, and and this extension of, of drinking up time as well, I think it's uh, it is well known um, by many um, that there are issues around the working time regulations, working time directives, um, expectation on workers in this sector to work long hours, um, and then that would be followed by by coming in very early the next morning. Um, See our our uh, industry leaders will will say that this is this is an exception. This is a few rogue employers, but from from our findings, this is this is becoming all too common in the industry, and we we feel that that the bill should um, should take a look at that, and it should be considered um, in this bill. The the final point that that I want to make is is around both the the industry codes of practice um, and the potential for for conditions um, to be placed on licenses. I think uh, our, our licensing officers um, do need a bit more scope um, and any shakeup um, to the regulations to be able to take submissions from other relevant bodies, um, other than the likes of, of the PSNI or, or the authorities um, on this, and that should include representative bodies of workers. Um, we are, we're the only um, representative organisation of, of workers in this sec sector with, with a significant um, membership. There are indeed, of course, other unions with with a smaller membership, and we feel that that will further strengthen um, our licensing regime. Will further help us tackle um, rogue employers, um, but will also strengthen um, rights in in this sector by allowing for that and, and allowing for some conditionality and, and social clauses to be placed in licenses, as is being done and explored in in Britain particularly in Scotland, where obviously licensing falls uh, a lot on, on local councils and there, there are a series of changes being proposed across Scotland, including uh, ensuring staff get home safely, tackling the, the scourge of, of sexual harassment, which is particularly sharp in this sector, 
um, but also uh, in encouraging employers to sign up to um, what's the Scottish government initial, the principles of fair work, which is something that I appreciate, uh, not not purely within the scope of this of this bill, but it, it would certainly be be a step forward towards uh, strengthening workers' rights um, if, if those submissions were, were allowed. Okay, Neil, thank you for that. Um, and I think actually that, that point you made there to do with the industry code of practice, that might actually lead to us actually having a separate witness session to do with industry codes of practice, just to um, get a bit more information on how all of that actually works in practice. So thanks for highlighting that there too. Um, I, I just want to, highlight a couple of things that you'd put in your paper and you'd mentioned there about the drinking up time um, and I know as a committee we have looked at the drinking up time and we have looked at the effect that will have on our criminal justice system, the effect that might have on our health service, the effect that might have on our taxi drivers, all of those people but um, we haven't really honed in to the effect that actually has on staff. And you're absolutely right when I was reading your, your submission, um, just the, the risk that that poses to staff at times um, because of the of, of, of excess alcohol, I suppose, being the, the root of, of that problem. Now, we know that um, the bill as drafted allows for regulations to revert back to the 30 minutes, um, presumably to allow a review um, of how, it, how the, the, the R will work. Um, would you be able to support the extension if the review was guaranteed in some way? Um, that, that would be looked at to see how the extension worked and if it wasn't working from all, all concerned, including the staff side. Um, how would you feel about that? Yeah, we can appreciate that it, it is a bit conditional um, in terms of what we're saying about an expected increase in, in abuse or um, in, in, in the, the violations of, of workers' rights to, to rest periods. I think uh, a review um, would, would, would have to be essential um, if, if this is ruled out in terms of that. And I think it should be something that uh, should, should heavily con, uh, consider the, the, the views of, of workers. Um, I think there are going to be responsible employers um, that are going to ensure that staff get their correct rest periods. However, um, we're, we're, we're deeply, deeply concerned um, about the impact that it's it's going to have in staff where where employers can't see the the wood for the trees um, in terms of this and also potential um, employment uh, law changes down the line where where those rest periods may may come under threat. And I suppose as we come come out of the out of uh, the the pandemic and go into post COVID society, we're going to to see um, certainly those employers want to see uh, as long hours as possible to make money or to recoup money. Um, because we know they're in great financial difficulty as well. And that brings me on to the other issue they want to talk to you about was the Easter opening. Um, you put in some concern about Easter opening around staff and had mentioned about um, opting out um, of, of the, that Easter period, um, for example, for religious reasons. Um, I mean, I know certainly um, that for many people, um, whether it's Easter Sunday or any other Sunday, it's important. Any Sunday is important to them. It doesn't have to be Easter Sunday. It could be important to them. And we know whenever um, that our shops and stuff started to open on Sundays, there were certain things put in place that staff wouldn't be put under pressure. Um, do you think that we need to put something in the bill or, or should that be in subsequent um, regulations after that? I think this is an opportunity to amend the bill to include the option for staff to opt out of working around the Easter period. And of course, we've we've also uh, included provision for, for staff that, that have non-Christian um, beliefs as well to potentially object to the, you know, being involved in the sale of, of alcohol during, uh, during certain periods as well. I think that is something that does heavily fall within the, the remit of, of licensing as well as employment law. And workers' rights, and I think it would be positive if the if the committee could take that back and examine potential amendments uh, to the bill around that. Okay. Look, thank thank you, Nate. That, that thank you, and thank you for your submission. I'm going to open up to members. I have Kelly has asked to come in. Kelly. Hi. 
Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Neil. Neil, uh, I'll declare an interest here as being a former union rep for Beck 2, that's Broadcast Entertainment, Cinema and Theatre Union. Um, Neil, on that basis of, of my experience, I find it quite difficult to actually see how in this bill, in this legislation, that human, you know, HR and, uh, uh, you know, how labour relations can be fitted into it. Um, I can certainly see how you know, if, if the industry codes of practice could be improved upon for staff and licensing officers may well take into consideration where there's a bad employer. However, it's proving that. So I'm just thinking about, I know we can talk about anecdotal evidence, but unless we have the outcome of a tribunal where an employer has been found guilty, um, you know, or something like that. So I'm just, I'm just worried that we could, you know, put a black mark across a whole industry when actually it's only a few employers that are, are tearing into it. Now, having worked in a bar um, for a significant amount of time when I was a lot younger, um, you're absolutely right. It, it's prevalent across the whole of the sector that, that people do work long hours, the pay isn't very good. It is quite challenging conditions, especially if you do have um, drunk people coming at you and health and safety is a concern but that's all labour relations as opposed to licensing I'm just wondering has there been any discussion between um, Unite and the Department of the Economy um, on improving um, the situation for workers in this sector have you any ideas of how an employee could use or provide the proof for a licensing officer who will not be over the detail, of, they'll be over the detail of, of the license and, and the regulations that are required for premises such as this, but not necessarily all the HR laws. Um, how, what sort of proof would you be looking to be included? Um, and I'm actually just thinking as well about social clauses. There is a discussion going on within the Department of Finance at the moment, but it's social clauses tied into government funding. Um, I'm not sure how social clauses can fit into a licensing requirement book unless there's there's a form of enforcement and again that takes me back to how to prove it yeah i think it's a it's a good question i'll maybe uh start on on the question around discussions with the department for economy we've, we've met with the minister um on on, on one occasion now and um, but have had some some correspondence back and forth around the issue of workers rights within this sector, uh, primarily, obviously, through the impact of, of the pandemic. And it's unfortunately had to go down the route of, of discussing redundancies and, and redundancy protections, as opposed to engaging much more positively about how we can actually strengthen uh, workplace rights. But I think from that, there, there is a point around employers um, and, and the industry facing a new normal coming out of this pandemic. and. The, the expectation of, of workers and our members is that with an extension to the rights of employers to open later, to be able to generate more sales and more turnover, there, there should be naturally an extension in, 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 in workers' rights and, and in, also in the compensation of workers uh, for working um, those longer hours. I think it would be a shame if, if the bill couldn't um, look in more detail at, at social clauses, but also at, at taking submissions from representative bodies of workers rather than individual employees, um, where we can prove, obviously, where an employer has been irresponsible in their employment practices, for example, through, uh, through tribunal cases, um, which would, would be a start or ongoing um, industrial disputes um, would, would, would be another um, would be another issue that, that should be looked at around licensing. I think as well as that, there, there is a role um, in terms of reports that are made to, to local councils um, in regards to health and safety. And I think that's particularly sharp for workers in the context of this pandemic, because we have seen a, a handful um, of employers during the last period of reopening that were engaging in, in very irresponsible practices in terms of the COVID regulations, but also incredibly irresponsible practices in relation to their, to their licensing obligations and their broad obligations of, of, of the duty of care, not just to their customers and staff, but to the local community uh, as, as, as well. Just the fin final point I, I, I want to make on that, because uh, it, is, it is difficult 
um, you know, to, to just kind of rider everything on the bill, you know, the shopping list that, that workers and unions um, would like to see um, in this sector. Um, however, whenever we were talking about uh, conditionality and, and social clauses, we used the example of uh, procurement and, and planning legislation, particularly where public money is being spent. There is obviously the, the option for specific and special conditions to be placed on the likes of an entertainment's license at the moment by, by local councils. And we think that that, that sort of model um, can, can be used um, particularly um, in, in, a, in a broad sense. In a, you know, there's obviously no one size fits all. They actually start to uh, examine uh, policies that employers have in relation to sexual harassment, the abuse of staff, um, but also consultation uh, with with unions um, on this as well. And I think that's that's incredibly important, and it's maybe something that the bill is is lacking at this stage. Could you just explain that to me? How you get say, for instance, we were talking earlier there about local brewery. How would they enter into a negotiation with the union? You know, you're talking about maybe one or two man bands. Um, I just don't know. We're, we're talking as if they're government departments as opposed to individual employers. How much of a role? Because these employers may not even recognise unions, which is a difficulty. I always am a great believer that you don't work for anybody who doesn't recognise a union. But uh, how would that? How can we protect staff? How can we bring that forward? I'm just worried that the bill maybe isn't it, but sec, you know, legislation later might be place. I definitely think one thing that the the, the committee should consider is secondary legislation around this, um, just just to give you know this this evidence to the committee from from the best of my knowledge, um, we can count on 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 one hand the amount of uh, employers within this sector, indeed breweries, uh, pubs, hotels, and other licensed establishments that do have recognition agreements with unions. That's obviously a, a, a much broader. Um, issue, uh, but it, but it is sort of reflective of of the of the lack of uh, of consultation or representation for workers in this sector. However, the the model that we take in the the United Hospitality branch is we take a sectoral view to this. So while we may have one or two members in in one pub, um, we're 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 hundred strong in terms of particularly in terms of bartenders um, across. Northern Ireland, um, it, it is a small industry, um, and, and we, we we do hear about these violations and support members potentially through individual grievances, um, or or raising um, individual health and safety concerns to the to the relevant authorities, namely uh, the, the the local councils. At this stage, I I don't think we should be uh, saying that you know I don't, I don't think this bill um, would be positive, but I don't think this bill is going to mandate uh, sectoral or mandatory collective bargaining um, in this sector. I think that is, is something the Assembly should, should look at it in the, in the future. Um, however, whenever we are talking about codes of practice, um, it, it, it was alarming for, for both ourselves um, and, and, and other unions within the sector that, that there was no mention of, of trade unions at that point. And I think that's something that can be immediately addressed. Okay. Um, just a couple of last questions. Um, just thinking about, uh, as well as the, the care of the employees, we know that they're working on work and temperature. Well, we'll see what's going to happen with that now with Brexit happening at the 48 hours. The nighttime economy, you've talked about the safety of, of staff getting home. And we have, you know, as a, as a committee, we've asked quite a lot of questions about people leaving the premises that wee bit later. And we know at the minute, if you take somewhere like Belfast for that nighttime economy, the transport access at that time of the night, well, there's no public transport other than taxis. Uh, um, I'm just thinking that there should be something in the bill that ties into the provision of transport, not just for staff, but for the customers coming out. Should there be something considered there? I think that's absolutely a consideration. Um, before before we talk about workers, if you're even talking about customers um, coming out, there's clearly an issue, and I believe you know this this extension to the drinking up time and extension to 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 licensing hours is, is an attempt to look at that about how you can stagger already overburdened um, taxi services 
our, our concern is the, the unintended consequences and, and, and the effect in practice um, of, of, of doing that. Um, I think transport has to be looked I think there's a broader question about um, the provision of nighttime public transport, not just within Belfast, but, but within rural areas as well. Our concern is, at the moment, the, the safety of staff getting home is, is massively reliant on taxi services. This is a low paid sector. Um, we have heard testimony um, from, from particularly uh, female members of staff across the industry who um, are, are at the sharp end of sexual harassment, but have actually reported to us that they put up with a certain level of that in order to make tips, in order to afford their taxi home, in order to get home safely, because they, 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 you know, they fear about walking home alone at night. And that, that, is a, that is a huge concern for us. The amount of businesses within Belfast that provide a taxi allowance or paid transport home to their staff is, is dwindling. Um, we're concerned about the, the effect of that and the removal of those, of those terms of employment as, as we come out of this pandemic as well. And um, employers are looking at a derogation of terms or signing staff up to, to new contracts. Um, so we believe that there, there, there is a duty um, on, on, the, on the, the, the powers that be on the assembly here. They actually legislate for that, we're not asking for a clause saying employers must pay for staff taxis home, but in extending an employer's duty of care to ensure that staff get home safely. And we would hope that the intended effect of that would be where you have smaller businesses, where you maybe, for example, have two members of staff working and a, a manager who drives. Maybe staff get lifts home, and obviously that then the manager's additional expense is covered by by the employer for that. In, in larger hotels that, for example, have transport available to their guests and the likes of minibuses, et cetera. Um, we would like to see, see that rolled out and made available to staff. Um, and in other circumstances, that would obviously include the, the provision of, of get home safe schemes, um, of taxi vouchers um, and, and, and various uh, client accounts set up by these companies to ensure that staff get home safely, because um, that is, a huge health and safety concern that's not directly within the scope of the workplace, but it's, 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 it's actually quite worrying. Some of the reports that we hear about staff not making enough money in tips, so they choose to walk home alone at night and then um, have, have, have unfortunately been the, the victims of, of, uh, of assault, harassment and, and violence. One of the considerations that certainly weighs heavy. We may enable customers to enjoy um, a slightly later offering, but it's the staff that have to work there. If, if I had my way, we would have a uni universal basic income and, and staff would all be able to get paid. But as we've seen through COVID, um, unfortunately, hospitality staff are the first to have been hit and hit hard. And um, we've certainly seen that the, the levels of salary that they get is normally not very good either but uh, no thank you for that Neil it's 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 another side to this the impact of this or the effects of this licensing um that we certainly will be taking consideration of thank you okay thank you Kelly um no other member has indicated that they want oh sorry there's Mark has just come in Mark go ahead go ahead Mark thank you chair and thanks Neil for the the evidence there that you've given an extremely important issue that you've come here to speak on. I'd like to thank you not just for what you've said today, but, but for the work that you're doing and have been doing for some time now. Just one thing there, Neil, you referred to this as a small industry, but hospitality, if you look across all pubs, restaurants, cafes, hotels, it's actually a very big industry and, and, and one of the few industries in Northern Ireland that we maybe have the potential uh, to grow. Now, you referred to your own uh, membership as being hundreds strong. Have you any idea sort of what percentage of hospitality workers are members of yours? Are there other unions that hospitality workers are, are, are members of? Because I think it's extremely important that we do what we can to make the workers out there aware of your existence, because there's probably lots of them that aren't, despite the great work that you're doing. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting question. Obviously, we're we're talking about an industry that sustains sixty five thousand jobs pre pandemic, and um, that has obviously declined massively as a as a result of the pandemic. Um, it's, it's a separate issue to this committee, um, but some of the some of the figures that um, we're we're currently researching. Um, are quite alarming, um, namely because of the effect of precarious and zero hour contracts that are coming up in the redundancy figures at the moment. Just to be clear, we're uh, very new to this this industry and this sector in terms of uh, a, a union. Uh, I, I was not in any way wanting to come across as critical of you. Of course, you know. yeah. It's, uh, but in in terms of that, I actually think there's 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 been that the absence of of a, of a workers' organisation for workers in in hospitality for a number of decades. Now, just in terms of other organisations that, that that do represent workers in this sector, you would have the, the the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union that predominantly represents workers within fast food as well, and um, so they won't be. Heavily um, as, as 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 heavily affected uh, by the by the impact of this bill, and there's also the the GMB, which is another general workers union that does have uh, members across hotels and hospitality. But we would be the the primary, and we're the only union that that has a, a, a spoke campaign and a spoke branch uh, for workers um, in this sector. Just on your question, about sorry, Neil, can I just ask you another week supplementary? And see, in terms of engagement with employers, how have you found that? Because I, I know I always have to declare, not just here, my family own, own licensed premises, but I know plenty of people in, in the industry uh, who would probably welcome, believe it or not, as employers, not just employees, a, a strong union because, well, in any workplace, I think it's, well, it, it's, it's an accepted fact that a happy workplace is a productive uh, workplace, but it's hard to think of anything where a happy staff is more important than in hospitality, where you're the public face, you're meeting and greeting. Uh, so I'd be interested to see sort of how how employers are taken to you or how you're getting on there. To to be honest, it has been a bit of a mixed bag, and certainly there there are a section of more progressive employers that. That do recognise the the positive role that that a union can play um, in the sector. On unfortunately, we've we've also been met with hostility, and I think it's a lot to do with the uphill battle to to claw back um, rights for workers in this sector. Where um, to I'm sure the employers um, everything that we come to them with is is negative at yes. this stage. Um, which, 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 which is an issue, but I think it ref, ref, reflects the, the 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 amount of work that needs to be done to strengthen employment rights in this sector. Because I think with sixty five thousand employees, it's probably fair to say that there's a mixed bag there as well. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, the 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 issue here at the moment, uh, primarily for us, is 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 redundancies and and precarity. Of, of contracts, but prior to the the pandemic, one of the sharpest issues that that uh, we were we were raising with employers was was the incidences of uh, sexual harassment and abuse. And it is different; it's a different beast in hospitality because we're not talking about you know the the classic office you know sexual harassment of quid, uh, quid pro, pro quo. Uh, with with a manager or a person in a position of power, but rather a a customer who is in a who is in a position of of, of power over a a staff member, um, and that's that's very difficult to deal with and and to raise. One thing that we are trying to do um, and we're trying to do pre pandemic was get employers to sign up to our our fair hospitality charter, which includes commitments and as a step towards paying. The living wage, um, real um, in practice, anti-sexual harassment, zero tolerance policies, um, and and fur rotas and and, and and fur tips, which are which are two other issues which which stand out for workers in the sector. Okay, I'm sorry, I dragged you away from the bill, Neil, but I'll just take you back there for one final question. See the conditions that that you're raising concerns about today or in, in your evidence. Uh, 
Are they the experience of your members working in pubs and other premises in Britain where extended hours are already in place? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so in, in Scotland, where we would have the, the highest membership, we've, we've been able to negotiate with employers to include um, safe home um, schemes to ensure that, that staff are not out of pocket for getting home safely. Um, the effect has been, because this is a younger industry, there's certainly people who, who work in this as a, as a career and a lot more people should consider a career in this industry. Um, but predominantly younger staff means you have a, you have a shorter memory um, in, in, in terms of the, the changes to, to a licensing regime. And, uh, you know, 24 hour licensing has been in place in many areas of Britain for close to, to 10, 15 years at this stage. Um, so what, what we have been doing in, in Britain has been accepting the, the current licensing regime and framework, but looking at, 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 at how, we, how we improve that. And I suppose that's where, where the principles of fair work come in and, and the safe transport home come in. Okay, super. Thank you, Neil. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Okay, Mark, thank you. Um, no other member then wants to um, add any comment or question at this stage. So, Neil, can I thank you? Um, again, for bringing us another perspective um, in our evidence Thanks, gathering. Thank you, Neil. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item 11, and it's a briefing from Movie House Cinemas on the licensing and registration of clubs bill. And yet again, we'll have another perspective on the bill um, coming forward. So can I welcome Michael McAdam to the meeting? Michael, you're very welcome. Michael, can I ask you to go ahead and brief the committee and then we'll ask you some questions? Certainly. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for the opportunity um, to, to speak to you today. So Movie House Cinema is, well, a lot of people may know of us. We're a local company. I started the cinema um, business in 1990, so we're now 30 years old. Um, we worked from humble beginnings in Glen Gormley. We now have four locations. We did have five, but we sold the Dublin Road premises, which you may be aware of. Uh, a couple of years ago. So we have Yorkgate, we have Glen Gormley, we have a small cinema in Mahara, little three screen, and then we have the Jet Centre Entertainment Complex in, in Coleraine, which also has an eight screen cinema. And we've been working hard for many years, you know, but we, have, we employ a lot of local people. And of course, then all our suppliers uh, are, are local as well. We've invested heavily in our business constantly because, and that's why we're still here after 30 years, um, I would go as far as to say is that the movie house hopper at the moment is second to none. We have been working very hard up, up, well, over the 30 years, we've been working hard, constantly updating everything that we've been doing. For instance, I mean, going back in the early days, we would have been putting in new sound systems. We were the first, uh, we were 12th and 13th in the world to have DTS digital sound. We then moved on to refer, refurbing seats and so on. And now we're back to that again. And uh, I'm going to show you just a couple of photographs, if I may, of the kind of offering that we have here um, in, in Movie House. And um, we have this in most of our cinemas now, where we have, um, you can see our, our, our two young people sitting there with their feet up. Now, that maybe doesn't show you a great deal. This is the kind of, this is, for instance, this is the, the type of theatre that we have. Now, this is screen, I think, 8 or screen 14 here in New York 8. Now, originally, this screen would have had 450 people. We're now down to 230 people, simply because the size of the seats. And, and if we flick through again, we can give you a, a, another look at, at the type of um, seat that we're putting in. Now, not just us, my friends and Omniplex, where you're, you know, we are rivals, but we're all, we're all going to the same offering because we're trying to get people out of their seats, out of, out of their sofas at home. Um, and it's a quite a difficult thing to do. And unless our offering here in the cinema is better than what they have at home, then people are just going to stay in the house. So it's always amazed me over the years how the um, cinema offering has never been able to offer alcohol. And uh, you know, over the years, I've been a fault of many, many businesses and I've had a chance to look at the licensing uh, as, as it stands. And, and probably the reason cinemas never had a license is perhaps 
nobody ever wanted one. And certainly if you think back to the days of the old Curzon cinema and so on, there certainly wouldn't have been any room. Uh, they had hardly had any room for a shop, never mind the, the, the chance to, to, do, to put alcohol on. But when you look at the act, you will see that um, You will see what I'm sorry for stuttering here, but what it, what it actually says, I'm making my, I'm making my facts right here. It's it's cinemas are not defined as a place of public entertainment. Now I find that bizarre because at the peak of movie house when we were all five cinemas, we had one point one point five million admissions a year. We're now just over the one million admissions a year. So if we aren't entertaining a million people a year, I don't know what we're doing and why we're not included in that definition. And it seems odd to us that you know you can go to a cinema, you can go to a theatre, you can go to the opera house, you can go to the lyric, you can go to the Mac, you can go even uh, local to me up in Glen Gormley, um, that there is a facility, a bar facility available for live shows, but not for cinema. Now, not that every cinema would potentially want to sell alcohol, but certainly in the challenging times that, that we're coming across now, what we're trying to do is give as much variety and as much choice to our customers as we possibly can. Now, and so when this opportunity came around, I thought, well, we have to put our best foot forward here and, and, and say to the committee, could that please be looked at? Because the cost of COVID, which we'll go on to a little bit later, business is very tough. And I mean, cinema has been, you know, our business has been destroyed. Well, we were trading at 20% of the levels on the weeks that we were open, 20% of what at the same time last year. That business doesn't work anymore. And ongoing from here, the difficulty that we are going to have is um, how are we going to get our customers in? Because social distancing, I believe, is with us for quite some time to come. So already we are looking for different ways in which we can increase our spend per head. And, um, and, and certainly when I look at, at, at colleagues both in Ireland and uh, England, Scotland and Wales with their friends in Everyman Cinemas and, and Cineworld, um, I mean, they all offer their customers the opportunity to bring a drink uh, into the theatre. And Everyman in particular um, would go for a food and beverage offer of which over 90% of their customers will bring an alcoholic beverage into the uh, into the theater and not so many much for Cine World, but but I mean it is it is quite interesting because Cine World and Everyman they are quite different they are quite different fields Everyman would have sofas and tables where um where you, where um, Cine World would be more traditional cinema I certainly you can see the seats that we were showing you there um, and could they up as cold rain we were showing you with the seats with, with the trays but we're, we're looking for different ways to bring people out because we're all being used to watching Netflix and Amazon so what else can we do to bring people out and what how else can we inspire them I mean we, we, we all do coffees now as well as and coffees and teas which are very very popular um, as opposed to people buying Coca-Cola. And, um, and we feel that adults being given the chance to have an alcoholic beverage, for instance, as well as showing cinema films, we also do live theatre. And uh, uh, it, it isn't that often with us, but I mean, but, but we have people coming in, particularly to our Korean location, when we have um, sometimes it's transmitted live, sometimes it's sent out as live, but it's, but it's pre-recorded to a theatre audience, which includes an information that we don't have in cinemas anymore. And our customers are coming out wanting the theatre experience, but they can't get it because we're not a place of public entertainment and therefore we can't sell alcohol. Now it's bizarre to me that if the Licensing Act does allow the consumption of alcohol in many um, areas, including uh, a seaman's canteen and also in the place of further education. So that allows our friends in Queen's Film Theatre in Belfast the opportunity to have a bar. Now they are a commercial cinema. They are showing quite often the same films as I'm showing, but they have the facility to offer their customers a beverage along with a popcorn and a Coke, of course. But we aren't, because we aren't on the grounds of a place of further education. I think that's grossly unfair. So I would ask the committee to, to look into this for us and, 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 and hopefully to give us the opportunity to have a level playing field, give us the opportunity 
to increase our spend per head for customers, to give our customers more choice, and, um, and overall to make the experience of going to the cinema a, a much more pleasant one than what it currently is. Okay, Michael. Michael, thank you for your uh, coming to join us today. Um, I absolutely, as a, a born and bred resident of Glengormley, I remember well the opening of your first cinema in Glengormley, and I'm very glad to say, as, a, as an elected representative for North Belfast, I have both Glengormley and Cityside. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted that you're able to come and join us today. And I know that um, when I had went to visit you um, prior to Christmas, um, this issue came up, and I actually uh, had never thought of it, was unaware that actually here in Northern Ireland, um, the, our cinemas are treated so very diff differently when it comes to licensing um, to the rest of the cinemas on these islands. So I'm, I'm glad that w we have the opportunity to hear from you. Um, I'm just saying, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. And you know, you'd mentioned there that QFT, because they're on a, a place of education, they're able to do that. And I absolutely know, and I, I, I do, I, and I know for a fact, that they do show uh, many of the same showings as yourselves and will get, get people going there purely because they can have um, a, an alcoholic drink um, while they're there and make an evening of it. Um, so I understand where you're coming from there. Um, I'm just wondering about movie, movie house cinemas, we very much see it as a family orientated cinema. Um, would you imagine that there will be any objections from you know parents um, uh, and things like that because of that fam family orientated theme that you've always promoted? I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so because we wouldn't be building licensed bars. You, you know, I mean, uh, I would. I mean, talking to my friend in Everyman Cinemas this morning, you know, that they it, it, it's glasses of wine and it's plastic bottles of beer. Um, and the high that would sit alongside people. Well, do you know what? It would depend on the film and so on. I wouldn't see it selling any alcohol in the afternoons. I, I don't think so. I think the alcohol would be uh, available in the evenings. And, and to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not sure that the lack of Glen Gormley, it, we would even apply for a license. I, I don't think that the that the, the, the desire would be there. I think certainly in Coleraine, uh, which is a much larger cinema, uh, and because we have large larger foyer space, and also for here here in York, where I'm talking to you from today, um, I think those two locations would very much um, welcome the opportunity to um, have a coffee bar bar area where, where people would be able to meet their friends beforehand because it's very very interesting that, that Coca, our friends in coca-cola are, are really good at understanding trends and, and and they've advised us for some years how people want to extend their evening and, and elongate your evening so going from work and having somewhere to meet their friends before they go on to watch the movie and then if the film is over, say, at 10 past nine, somewhere where they can go that isn't too far away to continue their evening. And with us having a facility like that in those two locations, it would be first class. But certainly, once again, I mean, when I look at, at our colleagues in Everyman and, and Cineworld and also few cinemas, I mean, all of these cinemas are in, in Ireland and they're, uh, and, and they're in England, Scotland and Wales. They're all offering all of their customers that opportunity. And I think that there may be a wee bit of novelty to begin with. And then I think it would settle down. But I mean, when we look at the consumption of alcohol within the city world, certainly when my friends there, it was only it would even have been two percent of, of, of their turnover. And certainly now uh the together concession turnover, you know, the popcorn sweets, and now it would be somewhere between three to um to five percent. So we're not expecting huge levels here. What we're talking about is choice. And the other interesting thing about being able to do it. One of the other things we're looking at is, that we're exploring as we try to rebuild our business out of COVID is perhaps offering people a chance of uh, to have a burger or to have something to eat within the cinemas. Now, that causes another difficulty for us because they will want to have a beverage, an alcoholic beverage with that most likely. Um, so we can't actually operate as a restaurant. 
because we don't have the right table and the right facilities within the theatre to do that. So we, 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 we couldn't all of a sudden become a restaurant. So very much having the opportunity to sell the alcohol and to, and to complement the burger with a beer or a glass of wine would really, really help us move into the food area. And, and you know, every man cinemas do incredible business with food and with beverages. But they wouldn't do it all day long. And certainly when it comes to the family business, I wouldn't see a family going in uh, and drinking alcohol, the parents drinking alcohol and so on. I don't think that that would happen. And any area that we would have, if it were to be a small area like Glen Gormley or Mahara, the, the alcohol would probably be out of sight. And, and so most people wouldn't be, even be aware of it. Another issue I wanted to bring up, and I know that you do it in your cinemas, is where you would have pri private um, viewing rooms, you know, for families or for a group of friends for a birthday party to show a movie. Um, and I know that that happens at QFT because I've actually been to, to one there as well. Um, and again, that puts you on the back foot where you've got maybe a, you know, a 40th birthday and they decide they want to all go to the, and watch yeah. a movie in one of your private rooms and uh, you're, you can offer them um, soft drinks and popcorn, but you can't offer them anything else. So, I mean, I, I get that that's an issue for you as well. Yeah, it is. But then just to expand then on that, you'd mentioned there with yourself that the, the likes of Glen Gormley and Mahara probably with the size of them, that you wouldn't bother looking at a license there. Uh, just on the round the cost of a license then, Michael, um, do you actually um, think that the, the, you, that that will be worth your while, given the fact that it's it's not a, it's not a bar. People are not going to there to stand and drink as in a bar. They're going there for maybe one or two or maybe three drinks um, before, during, and after their movie. Um, how do you feel about the costs of license? Do they do do they need to look at a, a, at a separate? type of license for the likes of cinemas or what way do you see that? I, I think surely it, it would be the same as what theatres currently are at the moment. Well, it's just an expansion of that there. If you can have an alcoholic drink in a theatre to allow a live performance, whatever the legislation, whatever the licensing act is there, I think should just automatically apply to cinemas. Okay, Michael. Um, I know that we've got you in to speak about COVID as well, but I'm going to ask members just if they have anything in relation to the bill first um, to ask questions on that. Um, Sinead has her hand up, um, so can I ask Sinead to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Michael. Uh, yeah, just um, I know you're going to touch on the COVID stuff, but I suppose you know that that has been a serious concern for yourselves and how you were classed in the regulations and things like that, but I'm sure we'll get to that um, um, in a little while. I think you do make a compelling case um, in terms of uh, like, you know, asking to be licensed in the same way as theatres. Uh, we have the Omniplex here in Newry, where, where I am, um, and certainly we've seen a, a major shift in the type of um, output in the Omniplex, you know, put not, you know whether it's um, classical music concerts, ballets, that, that type of yeah, theatre theatre product if, if you like and I suppose that's just the way that cinemas have had to adapt to, to the likes of Netflix and Amazon where, where movies are very often going straight onto those platforms and um, so certainly anything that can um, assist uh, our cinemas in terms of their survival in terms of new innovative ways for them to attract uh, an audience I think um, we, we definitely have to consider and we have to look at I think the chair touched on the, the issue of you know cinemas generally being a family um, arena. Uh, so I suppose there's issues in terms of where you would sell the alcohol. Is it just at the interval? The way if you go to a theatre, you know during the interval you can go and get a drink or you can get a drink before or after the show. So is that the type of scenario that we're looking at at here? Um, and also. You were saying that, uh, and I wasn't aware of this, that you could get an alcohol beverage in, a, in some cinemas in, in the south and also across the water. How does that work out for them? And what, what if any, issues has arisen um, in those scenarios? Has it been a, you know, is it a, just an accepted form of, um, of offering once you go to those, those cinemas? Um, or has there been any sort of issues that maybe the, the committee might want to just consider in their, in their deliberations? 
Well, okay, let me, well, the first thing is first, uh, uh, sadly, we no longer have interfills in, in, our, in cinemas, uh, uh, sorry, in film shows. Now, in the live theatre, things is coming in from the Royal Opera House and so on. There will be the regular theatre interfill when people will come out. Um, but as regards to cinema, um, our colleagues in the U, uh, our, our, our colleagues um, in, in Ireland and in England, Scotland and Wales, are all um, selling their alcohol as people go in the door. In fact, I talked with every man there, and they say they're, they're, I mean, their customer would be. I'm not, uh, uh, this is wrong to class it this way, but bear with me. It's more of a like a like a, a kind of a, a highbrow audience, more of a perhaps a an audience which would say we maybe go for the more quirkier films, say the art house films. But certainly with them, I mean, ninety percent of their customers are going in with alcohol. Um, in fact, they even let people go in with glass. Now that we wouldn't be doing that. When we look at our our friends in Cine World, and, and we look at Parnell, um, the Parnell Centre in, in, in Dublin, what they have uh, for for UGC there is uh, a bar on the second or third floor where people go in, start their evening, buy their drinks, and then go into the theatre. So I mean. It, you know what, what? What we're asking for and what we've been doing, it, 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 it's been done for quite some time. It's not as if we're starting something new here. I am not aware. I, I sit on the committee of the um, a committee member of the UK Cinema Association, where have all of the big chains sitting there, and nobody's ever brought to my attention any type of difficulty within serving alcohol. And of course, you must remember also that you know we have to do age checks already. Um, when people go to the cinema, so our staff are already quite are quite aware of of when we have a a, a twelve day certificate of kids are coming without an adult and they can't get in. They're challenged when they're fifteen years old. They're challenged when they're eighteen years old. So we already have a lot of checks built into the cinema business. Um, so I don't think we're going to have. You know, I don't believe that 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 to date there's been any, any, that there's been any difficulties, and I I think. The best way to look at this as regards to Northern Ireland is maybe to have a word with the police here in Belfast in the area of Queen's Film Theatre because, you know, that is a university area and we hear good things about the area and we hear bad things about the area with the Holy Lands and so on. So uh, rather than me try and, you know, come up or, or, or say something, we could, deal with fact, you know, we could deal with facts here and have somebody have a talk to a local inspector to see has there been any issues with serving alcohol within QFT. So, Michael, would it, would it be a case of, the, am I right, there's a separate cinema license and then you have the entertainment license? So no, it's a cinema license only for us. That's all we have at the moment is a cinema license. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. So there's a cinema license and then you have, there's not you have, but there is an entertainment license. So are you talking yes. about scrapping the cinema license and then you guys being brought in under that entertainment license? Do you know, I, 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 I wouldn't be qualified to say how it should be done. I honestly don't know. I know that my friends on Omniplex applied for an entertainment license uh, for their Dundonald facility that was refused. So um, whether it's just an extension or an add-on to the cinema license, uh, because the local authorities are going to you know, be in control of, of the licensing anyhow. Um, I think that, that would probably be the easiest thing. It is a cinema license with an addition for alcohol. Okay, thanks, Michael. Look, I, I think that's, you know, there's there's a compelling argument here, and I think we have to do all we can to sort of to help our cinemas not only recover from COVID, but to adapt to the, the changes in, in, in your own market in terms of your competitors with Netflix and Amazon. Um, so, I, I, you know, as I say, it's compelling, and I, I'd look forward to, to examining this in greater detail further down the line. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Mark? Mark Durkin? There we go. Uh, Mark, can you hear us? We can uh, yes, yes, yes. Right, Sorry, Chair. And uh, thank you, Michael. Sinead touched on, on most of what I, I was going to there. I, I think I'd very much concur with her about the need to do everything we can to enhance or to allow cinemas to enhance the experience that uh, visitors have there. And you know, if that means that they can bring a glass of wine or a a bottle of beer and to watch a film, then I think we should look at how that can be uh, accommodated. We, we have seen how it has been an issue, and Michael's invited us to verify this with the PSMA in terms of the, the QFT, but also across the water. I'm not so familiar with, with down south now. I've never had a had a 
a beer or, or a drink <laughs> at a cinema down in Dublin. Uh, just one thing I wanted to ask though, Michael, is it much of an issue or has there ever been much of an issue with people bringing alcohol into the cinema? Um, on occasion, on occasion there has been. Um, I, 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 I will give you one example that, that did hit us quite hard where people did do this and that was the opening, the opening night of Fifty Shades of Grey when we were inundated <laughs> by several hundred women who had gone straight from work to the bar and whose handbags were filled with an assortment of everything. And, um, and that, that was the one time when I can say for sure, yes, there was an issue of people drinking alcohol. Um, in fact, we actually had to bring in um, bouncers for the rest of the, uh, the next two weeks of that, just to check people's handbags on the way in in order to prevent that from happening. But as a general thing, Mark, no, um, w w you know, we do a pick up between every, not just because of COVID, but we've always done this. As soon as the, as the show finishes, we go in and we lift up. So we know what's being left behind because, I mean, people are very lazy. And if they were enjoying a, a beer or something like that, they would leave the tin behind. And certainly I am not aware of any um, abuse um, currently or, or, or people actually doing that. I just don't think they even think about it. Okay. Thanks, Michael. That's all I just wanted to check. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, Michael, we have very little time left, I'm afraid, and I know we wanted to touch on the, the, the COVID issue, but just a, just a few, just a, if we can even just a couple of minutes, just Michael, um, I know when I had spoken to you when I visited uh, yourself down at, at York Gate before Christmas, you had mentioned to me um, the difficulties that you had faced in, in uh, applying for funding, because it's something you never, ever had to do before as a businessman. And also the difficulties around um, how cinemas seem to be left off any notifications or any regulations. So just, Michael, maybe just if you could just in a couple of minutes um, talk to us just a little bit about your experience with COVID. Well, I mean, COVID has been devastating to the cinema business, as you will see uh, and be aware. And currently all cinemas in the United Kingdom are closed. Um, and when we get a chance to reopen, I mean, I really don't know. Um, we're, we're dealing with a very serious situation and we've tried to adopt. And among the frustrations that we have felt is, um, you know, we've reduced uh, our friends, our friends in America and, and NATO, uh, the National Association of Theatre Owners, uh, produced a medical document, um, which was well over my head, but which, which was explaining how a cinema um, uh, visit was so much safer than most of our indoor uh, activities. Um, some of the frustrations that we, that we have found is, and, and probably other people will feel the same within the licensed trade because we've all tried to work and we've all tried to adopt. And I suppose we all feel that we've been, that we've been made a showcase of that. Uh, and yet, you know, when cinemas, pubs, restaurants have all been closed down, COVID has still continued. Our argument would be that you know, if we don't give people safe places to go to, they're going to go to their homes and they're going to drink alcohol and they're going to do bits and pieces and have parties because there's nowhere else to go to. And we were our feeling within the cinema industry was that of all the places, given the fact that when you go into a cinema, you're sitting down, you're not talking to people across the way, you're not shouting to the people in front of you, the people in front of you, you're, you have their head. So you're not talking directly to them. So any transfer of anything whatsoever is so limited within a cinema situation. And, and so the call we were trying to say was, look, we were, as we try to rebuild all of our businesses, I think it's unfair that we treat hospitality and leisure all in the same way. Now, that's going to make it difficult for the parts that be to decide, well, who is safe and who is not safe. But I think as we come out of this, we're going to have to do that. We're going to have, there's a big, big difference between 18 people sitting in a cinema, a cinema seat or a cinema screen that has maybe 50 empty seats, as opposed to people in a shopping mall that is packed as we saw Christmas time. Um, and, and yet, you know, we were forced to close and they were allowed to open. It kind of, it kind of feels crazy on fur, but we are where we are. And it's all about learning lessons on how we can go forward. And from the Senate perspective, we just wanted to say to ministers and, 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 and to say to your good selves today, you know, when these decisions are being made, as we start to reopen and possibly 
if we have to close again, that rather than tar everybody with the same brush, that perhaps we can maybe take time um, to have our own COVID police visit locations to give consideration to what is safe and what is deemed not safe. No, Michael, look, thank you for that, and I appreciate that, um, because I, I, I think as, as politicians, um, we sometimes lose sight that there are businesses like yourself that um, have, have spent an awful lot of money um, to try and make things as safe as possible for their customers, and, and pretty much that, that it's not even looked at. <laughs> um, as to how they can open and, 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 and open safely. So, Michael, look, I really appreciate you coming in today. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. I'm glad I had that visit to you back in um, early December where, you, where this issue arose when I mentioned the, the, the bill that we were doing. Um, and I, you know, I think there's general consensus from what we've heard from others in the, the committee today um, that, that we, would, we, we would want to see if what we can do to help out cinemas um, to be aligned with the rest of the United Kingdom um, and what their offering is. So, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Michael. Bye bye. Okay, members, um, we are going to move on then to agenda item 12 on our meeting pack, which is SR 2021 forward slash one, the COVID-19 heating payment scheme regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Members, you'll find a copy of this SR at page 98 of your meeting pack. Um, members will remember that this was brought up last week and we had a, a lengthy discussion on it last week and we had written through to the minister um, to ask for um, some sort of written clarification on the way forward. Can I just make members aware that I received a phone call yesterday evening from the Minister, and the Minister in that phone call uh, phoned me about this specific issue to assure me that she is, uh, the, her and the Department are doing everything that they can to ensure um, that this group of people who have been left out will be included. I think they've just to work out some minor details around how it's paid and, and things like that. But she has given me her assurance and asked I pass it on to the committee um, that that is the case. Um, so I'll just open up for comments in a while, Andy. I'll come, come to you first, and then I see Kelly has her hand up, Andy. Thank you, Chair. And at the outset, can I declare an interest? Um, I, I very much welcome the Minister's commitment in, in addressing um, this anomaly in respect of the, those that, that have been highlighted. Um, I do appreciate, obviously, there are particular sensitivities around security uh, of data. And, and I think, you know, obviously I'm not privy to any discussions that will be ongoing, but I think there is an easy solution where the Department have an understanding with the existing payment methods that are in place to pay. Um, the War Pension uh, Mobility Supplement, uh, and obviously they'll, it's for them to work that out, which I assume that's what they're referring to when, when they highlight that. But I, I very much welcome the Minister's commitment. I, I had intended to abstain on the SR today in respect of that issue, but uh, I won't do so on, on the basis that um, the Minister is, is going to resolve it. Uh, and I will place on record, it was never my intention through raising this issue to impact upon this payment for those other groups of people who will very much need it. And further to that, um, and I do appreciate that the department are under financial pressure, and if we highlight, for example, job start, but I would um, ask that we as a committee perhaps consider further to this issue, writing to the minister to ask the officials to look at and I know the Minister did say in the, the Assembly on Tuesday about identifying other groups of people that have perhaps been missed, but encourage the Department were the financial resources available to look at broadening uh, and extending the scope of this payment because I know very much, uh, I know very well there are a lot of households right across the province who would benefit from this, um, albeit £200, but it would be very much welcomed and, and, and very much beneficial to them. There are a lot of low income households out there in Northern Ireland who are, are struggling at this time, are struggling to heat their homes, uh, and I, I think it would be very much welcomed if the Department had the ability to extend this. Okay, and thanks for that, Andy. And just on that point that you have made there, the Minister also mentioned that in our conversation yesterday, um, that they were looking to see if they could you know, uh, further reach out to those others out there that we know 
that are really struggling and you know whether it's they don't know the system or they're you know they they they're not known to our various community and voluntary groups they're not known to our councils they're not known to our churches you know and they are missing out there's a lot of people that are missing out on on other things as well um so thank you for that andy kelly Thank you, Chair. Um, unfortunately, I've noticed that there's a problem with this um, rule. Um, OK, I'll take everybody, if you don't mind, to the eligibility criteria. And it says that um, it gives the list of, of um, different benefits that you need to be on, which are fine. That's no problem. But it's below that where it says that you have to, on any one day during qualifying week, and on that day we're ordinarily resident in Northern Ireland, and the qualifying week then is defined at the top of that page. Um, sorry, it's it's their page three. Um, it's our 104, page 104 in our packs. And then the qualifying week is defined as the 30th of November to Sunday the 6th of December. Qualifying week I get, but the problem is that we have people who are applying for PIP who are being turned down and are waiting forever for an appeal. Um, we also have people um, who are waiting on their PIP application being processed who maybe outside of COVID would actually have had their appeal heard or have had their application processed and be in receipt of that, um, of that benefit on that week. So my concern is that this is written in a way where there is no appeal process. It's only if you haven't received your payment by the 15th of February that you can then apply if you qualify. But what happens if you don't know if you're going to qualify because it's taken the appeal service um, so long to come forward with an appeal. So rather than holding up this rule, because I do think it's vitally important, and as Andy has said, we're not raising these things to cause delays, um, but we're raising them. I, I would like us to officially write to the minister to ask her to consider a further rule, not to delay this one, but a further rule um, to cover those people who would have normally have been on that if their appeal had been heard and was successful. So. I just don't want those people to be left out for the sake that the process because of COVID has been delayed, um, that they could be entitled to this. So say, for instance, their appeal is heard in March and their appeal confirms that they should have been on PIP, the higher rate as the qualification level requires, and they backdate that um, and they backdate it to the qualify, you know, before the qualifying week, then those people have missed out on this, on this £200 payment. Um, I would like the Minister and the Department to take consideration of those people and to not delay this one, but to write an additional rule in the future to cover those people um, that are being missed out on because they don't fall into the qualifying weeks just simply because their appeal or their application hasn't been processed. OK, Kelly, I will... Um... We will, I think the committee would be in full agreement with that, that we, we write to the Minister and ask that question. I mean, just on a point, I mean, it's too late for us to pray against this now at this stage anyway. And none of us wanted to do that. I think Andy made that point, actually. None of us wanted to go against this because we want to see this heating bill go out the door as soon as as soon as it, as, as possible. Um, so, but no, I will. I think the committee could agree to, if members are agreed, that we... we um, uh, to send that letter off to the minister. Anybody else want to make comments? Sorry, Andy. Note, um, it was obviously clarified further last week that this rule's already been made. It has. Yes. It has been made already, so we can't yeah. play against it. Um, Alex, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, <coughs> I think the minister's been genuine that she's looking to try and find a way for this, so I um, accept that. I don't think we can delay this anyway now. So, um, if, if she finds a way, will that mean another regulation coming before us? Uh, I would like some clarification on that. Yeah, it would mean a further a yeah. further regulation would have to be would have to come in front of us. Yeah. yeah well, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. Sure. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, maybe I should know this, but what would that mean in fact if a, a minister is willing to? This is due to be played out at the end. Uh, this of will happen. This the twenty fifth of January is the date that this will yeah. start rolling out. It's yeah. already because we agreed to it back when yes. it first came to us, yes. and that is the time whenever we should have put an objection in, which yes, we didn't no. do. So the wheels in motion were put in place yeah. um, for this. So this will come in as it stands, yeah. as it stands <laughs> on the, the the paperwork that we've been provided in our packs. That is how it will be ruled out on the twenty yeah. fifth of January. But the minister has given us her word. That, that group that Andy had spoken about uh, initially, um, uh, which was the ex-service, um, they would be included 
um, albeit the finer details of that have not been worked out. But if we wanted then what Kelly has said, then that actually changes um, the wording yeah. on this. So therefore, that would be a new a new rule would have to come forward to us, which isn't a big a big issue. But that could be done. It wouldn't delay. This no, it will not delay this in any way. Okay, members are members happy enough then that I put the question then to the committee? Yes. Okay. Uh, that, so sorry, sorry uh, Mark. Sorry, Mark. I didn't see your hand up. Sorry. Happy enough, absolutely, for you to put the question and the be like to be associated with uh, Andy and Kelly's remarks. Now, in terms of the letter to the minister, I've raised an issue previously about want or fuel payment. I don't know could I add this on the list letter or would it be a separate one? But uh, there is a definite issue there. I mean, the 13th of January was their target date. They have all payments issued and that hasn't happened yet. There are still people waiting on it. And just a, a, a few, just bear, indulge me for a wee second, just to read out a message I received from a fairly sensible uh, senior citizen yesterday. He says, hello again, re-winter fuel payment. I have today again spoken to someone about non-receipt of the winter fuel payment, only to be told that there will be no payments to eligible customers for the foreseeable future and that the predicted date of payments of 13th of January 2021 was unachievable in the current climate. Can you please address this abysmal state of affairs? It's just unacceptable to treat people like myself in this way due to the total incompetence of the English administrators of this benefit. Thank you. So I know it's not there for DFC administering it, yeah. but DFC clearly have a role to play here if there are uh, pensioners here who are not getting the assistance that they're entitled to and that many of them so badly need. No, Mark, I think that would be a separate letter, though I do think that is important, and I think that, that I would agree that we need to write on that. I know I had one in my office last week along the same lines that you were talking about because I saw the email correspondence um, from, from my office, um, though I do think it has now been paid, <coughs> and I do know that it, it has been. It's DWP that have taken this on uh, when, the, when the assembly was suspended. Um, they then have, have now taken on this role. So, I mean, that, that's hopefully that we can get this rolled back again into assembly hands. But it has. There's been problem after problem with it, but it, which is not, as you say, it's not necessarily the fault of the Department for Communities. Um, but in saying that, they are that they that is that is who we would go. That is uh, ultimately um, any complaint has to lie with them. So I have no difficulty in a separate letter going. And I know Andy wants to come in on this point as well, Andy. Yeah, sure. Okay, sorry. Are we going in there again? Sorry, Mark. Or Mark, did you want to come back or can I go to Andy? Oh, no, I, was, I was just apologising for jumping on something then rather than waiting. No, <laughs> but you're go okay. ahead. You're okay, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Similar to other members, I've had numerous inquiries in relation to this and I've been on the the, the winter fuel payment line and, and it was on as recently as yesterday and it's quote in March um, in respect of payments on that automated line. Uh, and I think it might also be helpful, obviously, uh, we don't want to go around the minister, we write to the minister, but I, I think we should also copy that correspondence into DWP yeah. uh, and, and highlight our frustration that, that these payments have not been made. Yeah. Um, I, I've written to DWP uh, through the correspondence line or, or email on a number of occasions uh, trying to resolve issues in respect to this and uh, so far, silence. <coughs> Okay, thanks for that, Andy. So that's two separate letters then that we're sending off. One to do with the, the COVID-19 payment um, to the Minister and then a second letter through to the Minister and copy that through to also to uh, Department of Work and Pensions um, uh, just at, at why this has happened. I mean, it isn't good enough if people are being told they're getting paid in March. Um, I would like to think by the time March comes, our weather might be slightly warmer when it's now they actually need it. Um, yeah, that's that's bad. Robin, you wanted to Yeah, I did, uh, um, in, in support of what Andy's suggesting, but rather than just write to DWP, why don't we just write to the DWP minister okay. and push it right up to, to that level rather than an official within DWP? No, so that's what I was... That's what you were suggesting? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there you are. D D DWP minister, then. That'll do. 
Okay, members, look, can I move on? Because I need to put this question in case I forget to move. Not that I'll be allowed to forget, I'm sure, but no. the clerk's here in the room. So can then I just then read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021 forward slash one, the COVID-19 heating payment scheme regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner statutory rules report has no objections to the rule. Okay, members. Um, I'll then move on to agenda item 13, which is correspondence. Members, you'll find the memo at page 108. Can I ask, is anybody anything they want to raise under the correspondence memo? No, nothing. Mark, your hand is still up, but I don't know if it's up or anything you wanted to raise. No, nope. sorry, nope. Chair. I'm fine. Nope, dead on. Okay. So then, members, can I have then, uh, members content, can I have agreement um, to action the correspondence as set out in the correspondence memo? Agreed. Agreed? Agreed. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay, agenda item 14 is our forward work programme. Can I inform members that at the meeting on the 28th of January 2021, we will be briefed by the following organisations on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. We will have Arma Cider Company. We will have the Public Health Agency and we will have Omniplex Cinemas. Um, also at that meeting then we will have a departmental briefing on the budget. Members, any comments? Content to note? Item for Agenda 14? Content? Content. Good stuff, thank you. Then I'll move on to end Agenda Item 15, which is any other business? Members, any other business you need to bring up? Andy? Sorry, Chair. Just, just on the previous issue there, very quickly, I should have said, see whenever the budget stuff's coming forward, can we make sure that um, the... Uh, broad headline figures are broken down because previous presentations we've received, uh, budget areas have been very high level uh, and it's good to see that detail below them in respect to that. For example, NDNA commitments have been bracketed as that. So, okay, we can ask. Yes, we can um, ask for that. Just Thank on you. AOB, would it be possible um, the IERP, the, the latest round of it, closed there back, I think it was the 6th of January, just to get an update on, on that, how many applications, uh -huh. how many people were successful, how many people have been unsuccessful, etc. Yep, absolutely. We'll do that as well. Thank you, Andy. Any other members, any business they want to bring up? No? Okay, all good. Thank you. Then can we can move on then to agenda item 16, which is date, time, location of next meeting. Our next meeting will take place here in room 29 next Thursday, the 28th of January at 9.15 again. Thank you, members. Thank you. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly 